bum 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 da 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 bum 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 Hello! Hello everyone, how are we all doing? So, it is now the 19th of October. Hello, Night6831, 10 questions prepared. That's fun. Carl Gosug, hello. Michael Cooch, hello. Um, mm. In the nicest way, Night6831, if you're not sure if this is a docks area, do we know why the Airspeed Limited never did any Douglas Dakota conversions? That's probably not my area. Um, it would be fun to find out, but not really my ballywhack. I have a friend who it might be the ballywhack of, but they're not awake at this time, though. Hello, Tenevarka. Hello, Michael Cooch. Hello, Calvin Gasberg. Hello, Timmy Locker. Hello, Bazaski. Hello, Nuck. Hello, Mark Harkness from Vancouver. Washington, uh, not <laughs> ah, near Portland, not Maine. Hmm. Hello, Glenn Stewart. Hello, Dan Freeman. Hello, DG40. Hello, As the Shore. Hello, 19th of October. Yes, hang on, no, it's the 16th, isn't it? Ah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, I found the wrong one. There again, that would have been fun to be talking to you all from the future. I might have to do that at some point. And it's the 16th. There we go. Ah oh, well. Luckily today's recording of videos are not going up to be upstreamed. Hello Jess P, hello Amelia Burrow, hello Nook, hello John Shea, hello Jamuf, hello Abzaski, Carl Gilbert. Clinister, the camera at the steady steady at last. The camera isn't that steady. Let's put it this way. If I do a little if I even wiggle my toe, and that's what I'm doing right now, is wiggling my toe. And the camera shakes. So what I'm doing is wiggling my toe. Hello, Eric, I can. Right then, today's discussion has changed from what it was supposed to be for a very simple reason. Someone asked a question. Or rather, Someone put a comment on my channel. And, well, the comment started off a long discussion in my mind, at which point I thought, you know what? I'm going to stick it, I'm going to actually make a live entirely around that comment. <sighs> it's fun when I do this. Well, I think it is. Other people might not be quite so sure about it being fun, but I find it fun. <laughs> so, the con was this. The British plan to kill Yamoto will be the same plan they used against the Bismarck. No. And there is a reason why Knights of Glade 3 1, it's not the same plan used to kill against, uh, use a Bis against a Bismarck. Quite simply, is the odds are if you're fighting, kind of like if you're fighting the Italians, you're fighting the Japanese, they're going to come out with more than one ship. If you're fighting the Germans, the odds are they're coming out with one, maybe two capital ships at best. The Shan Horse and Eisenhower come out, that's the only time really two capital ships come out to play for a long range operation. There is the Channel Dash. There is the channel dash, but other than that, it's usually only two ship. It's a maximum of usually one ship, not two, and K only rarely two. Which means your approach for dealing with those ships, because they're going in a surface radar profile, is different than if you're dealing with Yamoto. If you're dealing with Yamoto, the odds are she is bringing with her some other capital ships and some cruisers and some destroyers and I know the final end dash at the end of the war happens and I know that suicide mission but you do not plan on you getting to a point where your opponent is committing suicide well basically the naval version of suicide by cop you plan for actually fighting them in a likelihood scenario in which case the plan for dealing with Yamoto and this is one of the reasons why I point out that if 
the British and Americans had been told about Yamato before war began. They'd have been having kittens. Would have had to be based on having some sort of qualitative edge. Because there's a problem for the British. Their most powerful warships, Nelson and Rodney, are also a couple of their slowest in terms of capital ships. The modernised Queen Elizabeths are not some things you really want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Yamoto in. I know we joke about war spite, and the odds are she would have ended up there because of necessity, but again, it's not something you want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Yamoto in. But if you're talking about a battle group con uh, confrontation, you'd be talking about the British sending every single capital ship they could get in one group. It wouldn't be multiple hunting force. It wouldn't be Bismarck. It wouldn't be a couple of capital ships off there and a couple of capital ships off there. It wouldn't be holding anything in reserve. It would be everything concentrated in one fleet, and that fleet would do a fleet of on fleet engagement. And there would be carrier strikes, and there would be cruisers, and there would be torpedo runs from by destroyers. Because that is how you deal with something like Yamoto. Especially when you do not have an equivalent battle wagon. You deal with it by chucking everything at it. And that's what the British would do. But that made me start thinking about the way of war. Because the trouble is, it's often very quickly done in history. And especially in popular history and in media history. I.e. the joyous thing that are movies that it's a one-stop shot. One tactic is used for each scenario. Or it's the same tactic. When actually the reality is often a tactic is used once and it fits that scenario, but then it won't be used again in the rest of the war. It just won't be. We can consider a good example. Battle of River Plate. Very successful engagement as far as the British are concerned. Incredibly successful engagement. Think of another operation in World War II where a heavy cruiser was off to one side and a pair of light cruisers were off to the other side. You don't get to anything similar until you get to the Battle of North Cape. That's it. Otherwise doesn't really happen and it's a very successful tactic but it isn't suitable to the situations they find themselves in so they change mr i'm 99 percent sure this one isn't my fault you can never be 100 percent sure Uh, sure, Yamato was designed for being something like the Bismarck as well. True, I would say Yamato is designed for it better than Bismarck is. And look, uh, IJN actually had a fleet unlike the Kriegsmarine. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I was expecting to ask you why did the Canadian government not choose the Vickers Viscount for Douglas Dakota and B-25 Mitchell transport replacement? I have no idea, but the odds are politics. That's a little bit out of my area. Um, please remember naval historian. Yes, I do study a lot of the other stuff because I'm geek and very, very much like the wandering around the things. But that's Canadian Air Force procurement decisions in the 60s. Give me a break. <laughs> Give me a chance. I I could go study it up, but you know, not really my area of expertise. I have a friend who does do those sort of things. If you um, Victoria, if you look her up and ask her, then she's probably the one who. Let me just remember her surname. Oh, it's, it's Taylor. I'm sure it's Taylor, but let me just check. Would help if I 
it's spelled Victoria correctly. Yes, Victoria Taylor at Spitfire Philly. Probably she would know. I'm sure all the Queen Lizards together wouldn't be enough against Yamoto. It wouldn't be pretty. All the Queen Lizards together versus Yamoto would probably end up with a Queen Elizabeth winning. But I'm fairly certain the last standing vessel would either be Warspite or Warspite or Queen Elizabeth over the charred remains of an incredibly battered Yamoto after the other remaining ships have gone down valiantly, including probably knowing Barham bashing into Yamoto as a form of suicide run. Hi, Argy. Which is another reason why, and please note this, if the Japanese had revealed Yamato's existence in 1940, 1939-1940, that would have guaranteed the completion of the Lion class. Because the Royal Navy would... And I'll, let me put it this way. It might have also called, uh, guaranteed the scrapping of Vanguard, Anson and Howe before they're even completed. Duke of York would probably still be done. But they would put all their efforts into completing Lion Class and their 16-inch guns. That would be it. The British would basically build their Lions, which would be their ver equivalents of building the Iowas. And the whole reason would be to kill Yamoto. That would be the entire reason. Churchill would be yammering and yammering on them. I've given a lot of thought to that scenario, to the situation you give the British and the British. To be fair, have a fairly decent, decent design ready to go. And that is the Lions. They have it being instructed. It can do... It's a 90% job. And so the probably sensible thing for them is to complete it and build it, and they would be building them and completing them as quickly as they could. I mean, you would never have seen anything so fast. That combined with aircraft carriers, they would be hammering on the carriers to be built. Again, the sole reason being so the carriers can fly off airstrikes to slow down the capital ships. And it'd be sort of the Far Eastern Far East detachment would need a carrier. And that might well, well, let's put it this way. That would probably bide the Japanese till they probably feel they had to launch their strike at the end of 1942. So if you give the British two sort of so years, you might find a couple of lions are actually completed in time to be part of a new Force Z sent out to the Far East based around a couple of carriers and a couple of lions with maybe Repulse and Renown added on as reconnaissance assets. That's a whole new to 4Z. But that's the thing. That That's the point. Not knowing about Yamato meant the Japanese didn't have the time and deterrent factor the Yamato would have given them. But that also meant that the British were and the Americans weren't as well prepared as they might have been. Although, for the Americans, it might well have caused them to stop the construction on the Iowas and start focusing on the, the not the Dakotas, the ones that were coming after the Iowas, Montanas, probably the Long Tanners. They probably end up going with the 12, 16 inch guns design. Steam Rider, so if you have to keep your entire fleet in one stack to go hunt Yamato, how do you force an engagement, especially you have some ships that are slower? Carrier strike. You slow down the Yamato. You use torpedoes and bombs to try and slow down that ship as much as possible. So that it can't run. Again, like you did with Bismarck. Archie, I have the most devilish idea for a shell of uh, for, uh, for a shell, a 14 inch, 16 inch white phosphorus shell. How would that perform? Well, it's a good way to probably incinerate a small t a small town, 
Um, let's strip. What's the question? Two million orcs versus one modern battalion. Who wins? Um, how good is the logistics the battalion has? Because I have a feeling they might run out of rounds before they kill all the orcs. Even with mortars and all the other things, uh, which various people are pointing out here, um, orcs... There, two million is a lot of them. And most modern battalions are not... Well, they're theoretically roughly 600 people. But they aren't all carrying the same amount of ammunition, and... Yeah, I think a modern battalion probably run out of bullets before they killed two million orcs. I'm sorry, that's just the, the, you know. According to the video, Magical Infinite Bullets. My money would still be on the 2 billion orcs, because there's... Let's put it this way. Unless you're in a completely flat terrain scenario where you guys are on a hill and everyone else is flat and exposed and you can see them all coming and start picking them out of maximum range, again, that's a lot of things getting close to you. Oh, guys, weren't uh, one, two, one or two 14 inch star shells? I think they were. I, I don't think they were 14 inch star shells. I think they were probably a lot less than 14 inch. I think they were 4 inch star shells. Same with good. Dumb question, but would you most be able to lower her guns enough to hit a queen of of longside? Probably not, which is why the wind probably goes to war spite with a boarding action. Hi, Sage. Thank you for coming back. Um, I would usually think that RGA would usually think that five cover ships versus one, even if they're older ships, would just obliterate the other through volume of fire. It's range and speed to catch her up. After all, weren't the MOTOs thought to be the 45,000 ton Iowa's equivalents were not the 73,000 ton beasts they were? That was according to intelligence. There was also debate between British and American mm. intelligence as to whether or not they had 17-inch, um, 16-inch or 18-inch guns. Anok, if the later King George V and Vanguard were cancelled, could their armour uh, armor have been used or recycled for lions? Probably. Man, Cooch, with the lines being built, the, built the British start looking next general battleship. What does it look like? Modernized G3? They had a few designs for them. They basically look like expanded lines at various points. As I ask you, Shun Nicole is not created, there's no Dupi de Lom. Who and when designs an armored cruiser instead of the French? Oh, the Russians got there first. Glistrit, if think about Yamato, Shinano, would she made any difference at all if she managed to deploy? If she'd been deployed, let's say, managed to be deployed viable, viable for Midway or something like that, then she could have done something. She would, especially if she'd had a full air group. As it was when she was deployed, not really. She was a big image at that point. Hi, Jack Ray. You know, it could be a force of too. Would there be any point in having a battleship main gun star shell? Not really. Not really. I can see the reason why you might think there would be, but honestly... 
if you're launching a star shell that big, you are setting up a light to rival the sun. At which point, we have to worry for various people. I think I've got some food arriving. Very cool. It's nice and dry. But no, it would have been fun. I have got a whole set of books next to me. Rather importantly, for all this. Which does rather fit as well, having some books next to me. And as said, this whole question started me off thinking about the ways of war. Well, what's for dinner? Quite interesting. I already had my dinner today. I did roast pork. Which I thought was very nice. And so did everyone else. But apparently my family were all jonesing for the joyous thing that is the McFlurries. And I said no thank you to the McFlurry, so they got me some chicken nuggets. Mm. Mainly I said no to the McFlurry because I didn't want to get ice cream all the way down myself and in front of you all. I just knew Sod's Law it would happen. So, Andrew Lambert's The British Way of War, June Corbett, and the Battle for Na National Strategy. And it's good enough, it's a, as good a place as any to start off looking at for a way of war, i.e., a national strategy, i.e., an actual modus operandi that makes sense. And here is an interesting chat section in the chapter, which is titled Strategy, Culture and History. Corbett began using German <coughs> Corbett began using German strategic writing around the turn of the century. After the first naval law of eighteen ninety seven had exposed the Kaiser's desire for world power and naval might. German strategic thought provided a suitable theoretical structure to organise the practical ideas of the Colomb brothers. Enhance Mahan's pragmatic Ionian structure and develop the strategic template of Maurice and Henderson, who had recognised the limits of German practice in British conditions. The free Englishman had understood that a British way must, be placed, uh, must place practical concerns above elegant theories. Access to the German fort had been eased by the translation of military histories, tactical manuals and strategic arguments by specialist publishers targeting military readers. The translations influenced British thinking, few recognising the inherent danger of reading across from a continental military power to a global maritime empire. German strategic fort was different. It rejected Western European positivism, along with any attempt to link the natural sciences and human affairs, condemning all formal principles of military theory and persistently stressing the overriding importance of free circumstantial study, historical change and moral force. By 1900, German thinking reflected the reality that the Second Reich had moved from a European status quo power to one obsessed with world power or decline. This dangerous combination of anxiety and ambition was fueled by the anglophobic output of historian Heinrich von Tritschek, Tritschek and his followers, who included Albert Ter Alfred Turbots and uh, Friedrich von Berthardy, fought war with England inevitable. Ben Hardy's 1911 text, Germany and the Next War, Started many readers, not least Corbett. In 1914, Lord Bryce, a liberal Germanophile, was astonished by the amazing doctrines proclaimed there, which strike at the roots of all international morality 
as well as all the international law, and which threaten a return to primitive savagery, where every tribe was wont to plunder and massacre its neighbours. Ben Hardy's views were mainly based on the teachings of Professor of History Heinrich von Dietrich. To readers in other countries, and I trust to most readers in Germany also, they will appear to be an outburst of militarism run mad, the product of a brain intoxicated by the love of war and by overweening national vanity. They would have deserved little notice, much less refutation, but for one deplorable fact, viz. that action had recently been taken by the government of a great nation, though as we hope and trust without the approval of that nation, which is consistent with them, and seems to imply a belief in their soundness. Fun times. That's the thing. This is a book entitled The British Way of War, and yet it dives into the French way of war, the American way of war, the German way of war. All of these things, because guess what? They're interconnected. It's a very, very good book. My coach, we haven't seen the fluffy research assistants or assistant fluffy research assistant videos recently. Are they banned from the office? No, they're not banned from the office, but, um, pardon me. Realize what I did after I did it. Our uh, neighbors keep putting something down in their garden, we think. We're not sure what it is, and it makes the dogs very ill. So, and then they claim they're not actually putting anything down, but we're sort of going, well, where else is this coming from? And we've seen you putting stuff down, and then you tell us you're not putting that stuff down at all, so we kind of don't trust you. Um, so they're not really in the garden as much as they used to be. Lands, personally I'd like to see a canister shell and a battleship gun size gun. That would be interesting. That would be interesting. Jameth, Dr. Clark, if the Royal Navy knew of the Yamato in 1940, would they order a fistful of light fleet carriers pronto to bolster the fleet, the uh, Far East fleet, as they were built to mercantile standards and therefore quicker to build? Well, they're not built to completely mercantile standards by any stretch of the imagination. Um, they probably order everything. It'd be one of those scenarios where basically they would order full fleet carriers, light fleet carriers, and capital ships, probably the Lions, to be completed and just go build it all. And yes, I am drinking milk because I'm finishing off some milk which couldn't fit in the fridge. Hello, Chris Orion. Now that my system language has been swapped back to my mother tongue, good afternoon all. Good afternoon. Hi, Michael Patton. Come on, re-battleship uh, main gun star shell. 18-inch Japanese beehive anti-aircraft round, anyone? Yeah, there, that wasn't the only one being worked on. There were a few others looking at various forms of using your main gun to take out aircraft. Um, there's a whole air defence system set up in part of London, which might have been built around a 15-inch gun. I believe before Ringo went entirely into the deep end, he had tanks with 18-inch guns that had canister round options. Ringo? You've lost me on the Ringo. 
The only Ringo I can think of is the guy from the Beatles who used to read Tom's the Tank Engine. No worries, Stafford. It's true. I will John Ringo, military science fiction author. Very off the deep end these days. Okay. I will believe you and not look it up because then I will I would just be forced to correct it. Hello, Bishron. Sure, man. After watching Battleship New Jersey video, most someone thought a battleship should be capable of mine sweeping. Would using a battleship main armament for star shells sound beyond imagination? Not beyond imagination, but beyond practicality. Mark Harkness, the USN considered a 55k Lex 12x16, 55,000 ton Lexington 12x16, it's rejected. The General Board didn't want the battle fleet obsolete in that new naval race. What do you think of the Taylor D Design D? Was it correct to reject the ship? It was part of the Washington Treaty series. And that's what happened to them, the Washington Treaties. Hi, John Sykes. It's one of the realities of life that, sadly, I don't think the Lexingtons would have would have ignited a new a naval race, mainly because the U.S. would have built them, and then the British would have responded with the G3s, at which point they'd have gone, oh, sugar. That's pretty much what happens in these scenarios. This is a good book. And I am starting to do sort of work towards books which recommended for Christmas. So if you are looking for a book for Christmas for someone, most people would like this book. Who have a general interest in history. It's got enough political, naval, economic, and European history in it that it's a good all-rounder. As well as being something a naval historian would really, really love. Question, how would World War 1 and World War 2 go if the 15 inch 42 had the elevation and range of coastal 15 inch guns? Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Coastal batteries. Uh, 
Well, hmm. Maximum angle which the out of elevation that the normal ship ones could do was 20 degrees. They were raised to 30 degrees post World War Two, post World War One. I mean, um, so they could go 20 degrees. A coastal one could do roughly 40. In World War One, it looks like. So, how would Battle of War have gone? It would have been, uh, they would have been able to hit targets at a lot longer range. But you'd also need to balance that by needing probably a beamier and to maintain the speed, longer ship, which would have meant you'd have had a far larger Queen Elizabeth and R class. And even a bigger hood, let alone Nels uh, the Renown and Repulse. That's good. Would a light cruiser have been a real threat to a Lexington? Lexington has big guns, but light cruiser has a lot more, and they shoot a lot fast. And Lexington had, please don't spit at me, Alma. Uh, it wouldn't be the guns, which were even on Lexington's, it wouldn't be the uh, guns of the light cruiser, which would rob them. It would be the torpedoes. I know turn projections. Alfred, B228, hello. I recently watched one of the old black and white videos of the Des Moines class. I've seen the these, and all mention the 8 inch can be used in the A roll. How practical is that real in reality? Well, it's an option. One should never be upset about having an option. Um, it's not particularly a great option, but it's an option. But it's one of those things. Using the 8 inch in the AA roll, probably not going to actually net you a kill. But you might as well do it because it's going to do the whole breaking up at long range of enemy aircraft. It's one of those things. The 8 inch in the AA roll, kind of like the 6 inch in the AA roll, it fits very well with the World War II era doctrine and the 1950s doctrine of how you do air defense at sea. Where you have your shipboard fighter, your carrier fighters break up the enemy wings into flights. You have the long range artillery break up the flights into single aircraft. And then you have 40mm and 3 inch guns, etc., engaged to try and take out the single aircraft. It works under those scenarios. Once you get into a missile based air defense scenario, then the world becomes very different. Now, if I go wrong, why do people say Vice Admiral Holland miscalculated when the Ranger of Bismarck's gun at the range before Hood sank was below 15 degrees, meaning Hood was out of danger from plunging fire? Uh, lots of people write lots of things about Holland. Because he was involved in something famous and he didn't live to say, explain his thinking, so they ascribe whatever, about whatever ideas they can to him with very little information. At home productions, at the end of the Falcon's War, the RNS logistics line was near breaking point. What if anything is needed to change that? More RFA, RFA ships? A few more regent class ammo ships? More of everything. And probably, more importantly, um... You probably need also... Well, more of everything, definitely. And... More supply ships. Honestly, the British Royal Navy had a lot more frigates than they do today. And they were running out of frigates by the end of the Falklands War, in terms of viable ships.
So that's an injury in the blunders of Cold War. Why didn't the Royal Navy send for the Royal uh, RCN St. Laurent and Iroquois class of ships for their anti-air rolls and more landing deck in Hellos? I'm still stuck on us. Under what circumstance? Why send for them? And the other thing is, can if you send for them, are you going to get them? That's the point. If you ask for it, you'd better hope you're gonna. You hope you're gonna get it. If you don't get it, you're in trouble. And that's really the point. If you don't get it, if you ask for it and you don't get it, you're in trouble. And you don't want to do that. So, next book. Royal Navy in Eastern Waters, Lynchpin of Victory, 1935 to 1942 by Andrew Boyd. This is one of those books that gets forgotten far more often than it should. Churchill naturally observed these exchanges closely. He responded enthusiastically in the initial reports on Plan D. Seeing it as strategically sound and highly adapted to our inter interests, Britain should strengthen Stark's argument and do nothing inconsistent with it. Importantly, he saw little difference in, a p difference in deterrence effect between a US Navy fleet based at Singapore or Honolulu. He therefore instructed the Admiralty not to contest Stark's strong op op opposition to Singapore basing. Pound, accordingly, sent temporising replies to both Stark and Normley. Stressing the British delegation to the, com to the coming staff talks would approach matters with an open mind. Churchill was undoubtedly focused here on the big prize, consolidating American support for Britain where it most mattered, and ideally bringing her into the war. It is more des debatable whether he fully understood that in committing to an Atlantic first policy, the United States would no longer have a superior fleet on Japan's flank, and that Far East requirements would have to ass assume high priority for Britain if they were to take a lower priority for the United States. Meanwhile, there was a significant meeting at the Admiralty on the 10th of December. With the exception of Pound, this brought together all the key members of naval staff dealing with the Far East policy, and a potential US Navy role. Those present were the Vice Chief of Naval Staff, Phillips, the Acting Chief of Naval Staff, Fleet, Rear Admiral Sir Henry Harwood, Director of Plans, Captain Charles Daniel, Bailey, Belairs, and Rear Admiral Victor Dankwaters. The latter was the previous director of plans and about to head the British naval delegation in Washington. The meeting is important for three reasons. It encapsulated naval staff thinking on the Far East at this time, and it established Britain's opening naval positions for the forthcoming staff talks. It also outlined a better naval outcome for the Eastern Theatre at the forthcoming talks then would be achieved. The meeting agreed that Singapore remained the best option to base a fleet to deter a Japanese move south, but recognised it would be hard to get the US Navy to accept this. A key issue, therefore, was whether a fleet based at Honolulu could meet British needs. Threatening the Japanese homeland, including Tokyo and other cities, with attack by carrier-based aircraft might achieve the desired deterrence, but it was not clear whether the US Navy would countenance this, or whether it was logistically possible over a range of 3,350 uh, 3, miles. It is intriguing that the British raised this idea. The group no doubt had in mind the successful fleet air arm attack on Toronto, exactly a month earlier, as an example of how even a single carrier could achieve a strategic impact. However, the reference to Tokyo and other cities suggests that they had civilian rather than military targets in view. This, they clearly wanted to achieve the maximum political effect to persuade the Japanese leadership that deploying the bulk of its naval forces southward was too risky. This appears to be the first time the Royal Navy contemplated using naval aircraft against civilian targets, although it was a logical ev evolution of what the Royal Air Force was doing against Germany, and the plans to bombard Italian coastal targets with battleship gunfire. The idea anticipated the American raid on Tokyo in April 1942 using two-engined land bombers flown from U.S. Navy carriers. This operation, led by Lieutenant Colonel James Doolittle, did achieve a marked political effect, although it did negligible damage and was immensely complex to mount.
If the US would not compromise, contemplate carrier strikes, then Britain would argue that a limited offensive role from Honolulu would be insufficient and hopefully convince the US Navy of the need for a more forward basing. If carrier attack was feasible, Britain should accept Honolulu as the primary US Navy base, but push for strengthening the Asiatic fleet with two capital ships and the maximum possible air and submarine force at Manila. The Royal Navy would possibly also bolster Far East force def defences by early deployment of Force H to the Indian Ocean. Thank you, Jack Ray. Gifted 10 memberships. Thank you, Jack. My coach, Rian Rahon, what is your take on this thinking and why? I think he's trying to get the best possible engagement range. I think he's also trying to do his best to... Well, you have to remember, what is a win for Holland? Is a win sinking Bismarck, or is a win Bismarck going home? I would argue either of those two options are a win as far as Holland's concerned. So he's balancing those. He's not purposely putting his ship at risk. He's trying to turn, he's trying to manoeuvre, he's trying to make sure Bismarck cannot get away. Because the whole point is, worst comes to uh, worst comes to worst. The idea is, if he gets his ships damaged enough that he ends up having to withdraw, faced off against Bismarck, then Bismarck will be so damaged that she'll be easy prey to King George V steaming up fast behind. So, I think he's turning for better engagement. I think he is literally manoeuvring to try and get the best possible firing position, where his 15-inch guns can do the most damage. To the Bismarck. I think he's also forgetting that he's in a battle cruiser, not a battleship. But there again, he's got the Prince of Wales with him, and this is the trouble. When you tie together a battle cruiser and a battleship in a single division, they have to start acting like some sort of hybrid. And the battleship hasn't got the speed and maneuverability of the battle cruiser, and it hasn't and the battleship uh, cruiser hasn't got the armor and the sticking power of the battleship. So honestly they should have divided. I've said this before, in the, you know, the one thing I would have done differently to Holland is I would have probably divided up and called a cruiser to each of the capital ships and gone a, a, a formed two cruiser capital ship hi, uh, t combat teams and told them to engage that way and probably split fire with both ships, with one ship, uh, you know, them trying to go to either side of the Bismarck to divide her fire. I kind of what Harwood did it. Plate, River Plate. Hero and Cash. RG, Duck Lock, what would change if modern US 5 inch 62 counts, radars, fire control, other systems, or transported back to 1925 and Bjorn doesn't throw it away? Um. Air defense at sea gets dramatically better. Dramatically better. But also, so does fire control and land engagement by 5-inch guns. And you probably see a lot of ships going around, which people, which various nations will be thinking, Oh, they've only got four 5-inch guns. Ha, huh, that's funny. Because they've only got single mounts. And then watching them blast away. I don't know, they might adapt it to make a twin mount, but they'll be probably very heavy. But you might end up with a... Um, American version of a tribal class destroyer. You'd also end up with the British probably trying to do everything they can to get the information about our systems out of America. Anglo-American espionage is something we don't hear much about, but trust me, I'm fairly certain in the 1920s and 30s it was going both ways hard. I say, actually, everyone, why did the ERN have a habit of working their ships into oblivion? Because that's what we do. We get every usable hour out of it. John Evans, were the L class fitted with the 4 inch uh, high angle better regarded in A than the intermediate, intendedly in armed 4.7 inch ships? 
They were armed as uh, they were considered anti-aircraft specialists, but that's what they were considered as anti-aircraft destroyers. Tian Wong, hello, Tian. Why did the Anglo-French fleet stop halfway through the Darnells? They still had a strong enough force to push on to Constantinople. The Admiral made a mistake. Hello, my human. Good evening. We're just leading on the London train. Been to HS Belfast today in the Cabinet War Rooms. Cool. As I said earlier, if the UK had better has better carrier aircraft, well, actually, if it has a carrier present, i.e. not just victorious, Bismarck and Jürgen face a torpedo and dive bomber attack. Hmm. Sure, Hawaii didn't yet have the proper infrastructure to support the US Pacific Fleet. What would have happened if it had to support two fleets? It would have collapsed, probably, in the infrastructure. They'd have had to build something. In a world where Singapore holds out and the IJ surrenders is defeated in Malaya, what do changes in the Pacific? What doesn't get occupied as a result? It becomes a lot harder to push on to into Indonesia and push south past the Philippines. So Dutch East Indies might well survive, and various other parts of the, you know, the, I doubt the fighting gets as close to Australia as it does on the ground war, and it might well change who's in command in the southeastern theatre, because if you have Singapore stay, say, survive and win the fight, versus MacArthur forced out, that might be just the grounds Roosevelt needs to replace him as theatre commander and go, we now need to make this an allied operation so the southeast theatre will be under a British commander. And sorry, MacArthur, you will be ground forces or maybe not even ground forces commander. You'll be part of allied command Southeast Asia. So you'll be a subordinate commander in allied command Southeast Asia. Basically, any chance Roosevelt gets to do that, he will do it. And also, if you look, there is, I think Amelia's just used it, there is a new emoji going around for those who are members. There is a new membership emoji going around. Thank you, Night Heron Productions. And thank you, Jack Ray, for giving people the memberships. Uh... And by what degree does this improve submarine wolf pack operations against shipping, and how does it alter IGN operations? If you've got the submarines able to operate from Singapore, there's going to be no Japanese merchant movement in the South China Sea, and honestly, they'll be able to move up from there very far. So if they're operating from Singapore, they can go most of the East China Sea, pretty much, there won't be much of Japanese home waters they can't reach it could well start starving Japan very quickly because they don't have much in terms of infrastructure moving goods around their own country Raffaeza, good afternoon, did I get here before cutting? Yes you did Richards, how do they give the kill credit on a ship where 15 or 20 guns are blasting away at a single plane? Who gets the kill? Uh, whoever's first to claim it. No, they tend to do actually do put some effort into trying to work out who get who which gun position should be given the kill. I have questions. Is there a midway scenario in the China Sea instead of mid Pacific? Mm, there is a there is a possibility for that if you have a combined Allied fleet. Malaga, when did the Allies actually discover that Yamato had 18-inch guns? Did they manage to figure out before the end of the war? They did before the end of the war. They actually managed to find it out when they were engaged uh, before they were engaged by her. Uh, they found it out uh, about a year into the war began uh, beginning, and actually in the Far East they actually managed to work that out. So by about the end of 1942, beginning of 1943, they had it. They had worked it out and were concerned, and they were fairly sure by that point she had 18-inch guns. 
There is a good book I'd be getting to at some point, which is, I think, book number five on the list. Which does have some stuff about that in it. RG, re 5 inch 62 cal transport back to 1920. So, British ship running basically goes, I must find out how this thing is and how to make it. Also, I had the idea they would make a twin mount for the battleships. Secondary. Battleships and cruiser secondaries would get twin mounts. They'd probably, let's be honest, imagine the. Good lord. Do 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 Let's look at, uh, sorry, I'm just looking at the Atlanta class, and I'm just working out well, how many 5-inch 62s they could have taken. I think it's quite possible that you could have fitted them with 8 twin 5-inch 62s. In which case, Lord help anyone who's fighting in Atlanta class. Lord help anyone who's fighting in Atlanta class. Uh, nice segment from one. If the British get an F4F or A6M comparable aircraft, then the Battle of Britain is going to be one-sided slaughter. Um, F4 F4F, yes. A6M, no. But they did have F4F comparable aircraft. They were called Spitfires and Hurricanes in 1939-1942. So Battle of Britain was was a bit of a one-sided slaughter if you look at the actual loss rate for the Germans. Uh, I think if you think about the Mediterranean, if they get an F4F earlier in 1939, then the Mediterranean conflict becomes very, very different. That's very different. How useful could uh, the ten Hood's 10 5.5 inch guns have been at uh, Dunlop's Uh How good damaging could Hood's 4 inch guns? And Wales' 5.25 inch, uh, inch guns have been at DS. Not much. They could certainly have cleared anything on the decks, but they wouldn't have the armor penetration to do any more damage than that. That's it. New Mac before 72. How would the Japanese troops in Singapore react to being ordered to surrender? Um, I can't imagine it would be it would go down well. But if they've run out of food, supplies, and everything else, and that's what their, their legitimate senior officer orders them to do, they probably follow the orders. Most troops tend to not react well to being ordered to surrender. They probably actually attempt to retreat. And at that point, it's a case of... <clears throat> well, this is, the co this is the twist in the coin from what I was talking about with Germany and the invasion of France. And the running out of logistics. If the Japanese had started to retreat from Singapore, the British don't really have much there that they can chase after them with. So where do the Japanese go? Well, they probably retreat out of gun range, and probably keep retreating back to their, uh, their uh, back to any infrastructure and logistical support. So they probably retreat back to the other side of the Malay Peninsula and to the north. Which would allow the British to establish a defensive line about halfway up the Malay, Malay Peninsula. But it'd be a race between the British to get there and establish it and the Japanese to restock. And the British to try and interdict those supplies. So it'd be a fun, fun multi-part race going on. I know they were basically shotgun shells, but 3 and 5 inch always seemed like AA overkill. And if a plane got hit by a 3 inch or a 5 inch shell, sword shot, would there be anything left? 
if they got hit, nothing left, but they don't really do that. They sort of go there and they turn into fragmentation explosions. That's their whole point, really, their whole raison d'etre. Oh, a little heads up to everyone. Hopefully, if everything has gone to plan, I should have a new car this week. Well, new to me car. Which should actually be returned to a car I used to have, because I used to have a, v for, a Volvo V40. Uh, an older style estate version, not the newer style hatchbacky version. And, yeah. I found one. I paid the deposit and delivery price, and if it gets here and passes the inspection with the engineers, because I'm going to get it tested by my friendly local Volvo centre, for two reasons. One, because that then gives you guaranteed peace of mind, and two, if you get a full service done by Volvo, you get guaranteed Volvo assistance, which is better than the AA. Yeah, that's the reason you get the full service done by your Volvo dealer. Volvo assistance. Better protection than the AA. Anyway, um, if that, then I will have a new card wandering around, which will mean I'll be back going to the National Archives pretty much every Saturday for the foreseeing, foreseeable future while I get the various books written. I will be doing some travelling around the country. I'm putting some dates of when I'm in Portsmouth, when I'm going to be in... Southampton, and when I'm going to be in Lenin Palace and those sort of things. If anyone wants to come say hi to me while I'm wandering around, you're more than welcome to. And mainly the reason I'm doing that is because I like bumping into people, it's nice. Because usually I'm pottling around these places on my own, just chatting away to myself. It looks far better if there are people there for me to talk to. Far, far less lunatic if there are people there for me to talk to. Now, the next book we have is Nicholas Rogers, Command of the Ocean. <whistles> it's a good one. And nice to see friends. So, having the British Zero, aka the Gloucester F534, makes no difference over the UK, even though the comparable A6M can outrun that climb of BF109. No, it doesn't make much difference. Because the thing is, you can out. So can lots of aircraft can outclimb and outrun a BF109, but can they outfight a BF109? The point is, and this is going to sound terrible. If you, you've got the high-speed light aircraft, that's great if you want to do the dash-in attacks and get out of there. But if you can actually fight and do a dogfight because you've got to stop that air attack coming in, then that's not the aircraft you want to be in. You want to be in something which has a bit of armour and a bit of structural integrity and survivability. You want something rugged. Hence the F4F more than the A6M. Now, sir, did the Japanese actually support the RN getting two G3s? I certainly think they were in favour of it, mainly because it was good justify justification for them getting two of their battle cruisers built, and they were happy to accept the Americans getting two Lexingtons. That always tells you how good a design is when everyone is very happy for you to get two. And look, what happened to the old car? Uh, I was in an accident at sub five miles an hour. As um, Daniel Politics put it, low speed collision following brake fault. That was fun. I think not. Currently setting certain invoices up as a product in my accounting. <laughs> No one hurt, and yes, well insured, and the insurance has covered everything. <laughs> um, 
How goes, how goes the flower book? It's going. It's doing okay. In this country, remarked Voltaire, it is thought good to kill an admiral from time to time to give courage to the others. There was more truth in the epigram than perhaps he knew, for the execution of Bing had a profound effect on the morale climate of the navy, and sharply reversed the effects of the Battle of Toulon. The fates of Matthews and Lurstock had taught officers that misconduct with support in high places had nothing to fear. The fate of Bing taught them that even the most powerful political friends might not save an officer who failed to fight. Many things might go wrong with an attack on the enemy, but the only fatal error was not to risk it. Bing's death revived and reinforced the culture of aggressive determination which set British officers apart from their foreign contemporaries, and which in time gave them a steadily mounting psychological ascendancy. More and more in the course of the century, and for a long time, a long time afterwards, British officers encountered opponents who expected to be attacked, and more than half expected to be beaten. So that they were in action, in, went into action with an invisible disadvantage, which no amount of personal courage or numerical strength could entirely make up for. For the French Navy, this psychological burden was added to a traditional doctrine which regarded the completion of the mission as more important than battle or victory, and tended to depreciate or sneer of fighting. Um... Mm -hmm. Do you know what a naval battle is? Asked Maurepas. Two squadrons sail from the opposite ports. They manoeuvre. They meet. They fire. Please note, advice, and this was another reason I wasn't drinking iron brew earlier. Do not snort iron brew up your nose if you're laughing, okay? It itches. Iron brew is not something which is supposed to come out your nose. Just a heads up for anyone. Two squadrons sail from opposite ports, they manoeuvre, they meet, they fire, a few masts are shot away, a few sails torn, a few men killed, a lot of powder and shot wasted, and the sea remains no less salty than before. The animals agreed with the courtiers. Too often, these nail battles produce more noise than profit, Vice Admiral de Comte d'Estaing remarked a generation later, and his contemporary Rear Admiral Comte de Barri Comte Barras de saint Laurent explained that it is a principal war that one should risk a great deal to defend one's own position, but very little to attack the enemies. At the end of the century, the theorist Captain Joseph de Albert de Ramadour summed it up, the French Navy has always preferred the glory of achieving and safeguarding a conquest to the glory, perhaps more brilliant, but less substantial, of taking a few ships of the line. Thus it has kept more closely to the object of war. It's lovely when you have this lovely idea that we, will, we win by doing this, 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 but you're losing. But we win by doing the mission. But you're losing the war. But we win by doing the mission. But you're losing the war. Perhaps you're not doing the right thing. Perhaps part of the mission is getting control of the sea. By destroying the enemy fleet. Perhaps it's part of the mission. More accurately, it kept to the object of a convoy war in which context the British too believed in the primacy of the mission. British officers were always strictly ordered to remain in their convoys and not to be tempted on any account to abandon them. Uh, Captain Vian, in 1940, we need to have a conversation. The difference was that for the British, this was understood as a disagreeable but, exceptional, but essential exception to the general rule that an officer's first duty was always to defeat the enemy. French officers generally sailed under orders which defined battle as the exception to be risked only in particular unusual circumstances when the objects of the operation could not otherwise be attained. As a result, they tend to be psychologically unprepared to take opportunities of victory when they are offered. The Spanish Navy suffered from the same problem. In both cases, the doctrine of a mission made a good deal of sense for navies mainly designed to defend colonies and trade. It's much less helpful to navies which, wisely or unwisely, had been committed to a naval war against Britain, in which there was little to be achieved by remaining on the defensive. During 1758, good news began to reach Britain from the various parts of the world, and in many cases the psychological effects of the Battle of Mallorca and the death of Bing were clearly discernible. After heavy losses at the beginning of the war, the French had, resta had restarted the West Indian convoys in 1757. West Indian convoys in 1757. In October 1757, Captain, the Comte de Cachant, 
was lying at Cap Francis with five ships of the line and a convoy ready to sail for home, while the port was blockaded by three small ships under Captain Arthur Forrest. On the 21st, Kessent sailed to clear a path for the merchantman, and Forrest immediately attacked. In spite of the odds, the result was tactically indecisive, and both sides retreated to their port for repairs. Since Forrest's base, Port Royal, lay 300 miles to leeward, it was Kessent who profited, getting his convoy safely out on the 12th of November, long before the British ships were interned. Strategically, one can therefore say Forrest's colleagues were wrong to fight when their mere presence should, would have been and made it very difficult for Kessalt to save his con sail of his convoy. Morally, however, it was a tonic to British naval confidence that our captains were too gallant to be terrified at their formidable appearance. As Forrest Commander-in-Chief Rear Admiral Thomas Coates reported... Reported. It's a good book. It's always a good book, and it's on many, many editions and well worth reading. Raparosa, any point us on dealing with a three-legged dog? Don't be surprised at how manoeuvrable they are. Mm-hmm. RG, Dutch Clock, a while back I asked about IJF being created equal to the other two branches, you said it would involve the violence of war. How would the other nations react and what would change? Well, you might get the US actually creating their own air force, but it's unlikely. Considering the Royal Air Force already existed and various other nations had independent air forces by this point, and the US hadn't reacted. So basically they go, hmm, the Japanese have their own air force. Well, hey. If it did devolve into civil war, then it would be kind of a case of uh, who looks most good best for us. In a British case, they'd probably find themselves supporting the naval side. Uh, the Americans might, strangely enough, find themselves supporting the army side. Purely from the perspective that if the Japanese Navy loses, then the Japan doesn't have a navy and... Um, that then Japan won't get anywhere, whereas the British will be supported the naval side because they're their traditional allies. So you could get a proxy war between Britain and America being played out as the two most powerful nations in the world being played out in Japan between the army and the navy. Dan Pollux, having driven to Kew a couple of times during train strikes, I can affirm there is plenty of low-speed stop-start for the defi default to stop in. Very glad I can usually get the train. I usually get the, used to usually get the train as well. I now tend to usually drive, mainly because for me to get the train, I have to go up to Clam Junction and change. And since they changed the timetable again, that's turned into an absolutely onerous dogleg. You see, I'm the same for ginger ale as Pepsi. Ginger ale is worse than Pepsi, but I would I contest that Iron Brew is worse than ginger ale. The trouble is, I seem to have this habit of bursting into giggles when I'm laughing, when I'm uh, uh, getting basically getting triggered for giggles when I got my drink at about this level. And the trouble is, it then can end up snorting up, and yeah. You end up with stuff coming out your nose, and... Weird itches in there. Rapid Razor, were the Anandas considered cruisers because of the displacement? Yes. They didn't have destroyer guns, they had cruiser guns because they were fitted to a cruiser. You have to remember the phraseology of the language put fitted on uh, in the treaties. It's not Destroy a gun uh, that any gun below, uh, you know, a cru light cruiser has a gun greater than 5 inches or a bigger than less than 6 inches. No, it's you have a greater a gun less than 6.1 inches. A cruiser could be armed with all 4 inch guns and still be a cruiser. It just had to be over a certain tonnage of weight. Okay, and then and then we ask, as you like Japanese cars, are you getting a um, a GT86 and delivering two foot? No, I'm going back to a Volvo. I'm going back to Swedish cars. Oh, Norwegian, Scandinavian cars. Um, 
I tend to alter. Uh, I tend to alternate between Volvo and Subaru. I it was kind of strange because I've gone. I've had a Vauxhall, a Volvo, a Subaru, a Subaru, and a now another Volvo, probably. And these have both been V40s. These have both been Impreza's, and this was an Astra Merit Estate. Yes, I do remember all my cars. And no, I never buy a brand new car. I always buy cars which are mm, usually roughly around about the two grand mark because I am a cheapskate. Come on, Cameron, that sounds pretty scary. Nice, one. yeah. The Gloucester S five thirty four would likely have had to have had armor, and as Gloucester are going to have to replace the underpad Bristol Mercury nine with a Perseus or Hercules anyway. Yeah, it would have had to have some changes. Mark Harness, no one is fooled by the large light cruisers, courageous, glorious, and and cool Fisher on it. But as compromises, Fisher gets resistance as a third renown. Better for the R in long time. Yes, third renown is way better, and. If you don't have Courageous, Glorious, and Furious, then you have to convert other ships to the aircraft carriers, which means either, either it would be the G3 hulls, or it would be, depending on which were further along, the Admirals or the G3s would be the ones converted into Courageous, Glorious, and Furious in terms of the aircraft carriers. Why are the archives called Q? Are they in Q? Yes, they're in Q. In fact, if you go to the gardens, in, if you go to Q Gardens train station, you go out the the pub side of the platform, a pub side platform, and that will get you to the gardens. You go over the bridge, so the other side, other plus side of the, the line, other side, other line, and that will get you to the archives. Jack Ray, was it the Royal Navy in Eastern Waters that make a good gift? Um, any one of these books would make a good gift. Uh, let's see, we've got through... The British Way of War is always is always a good one. If I make use of this lovely box here behind me, I can put these here. So, we've done the British Way of War, that's a good gift. Royal Navy in Eastern Waters is a good gift, and I would argue that Command of the Ocean by Nicholas Rogers is a wonderful gift, but it is a massively thick historical tome. So, this one's good for someone who just got a, a basic interest in history. This one's good for someone who wants to look at naval history. And this one's for someone who is just a deeply history, is deeply interested in history. As it's got, if I give you an example, this chapter's list reads like... A Mountain of Iron, Operation 1649 to 1654. Cromwell's Hooves, Operation 1654 to 1659. A Looking Glass of Calamity, Administration 1649 to 1660. The Melody of Experienced Saints, Social History 1649 to 1660. And then it carries on. It's it's just colossal work. And Nicholas Rogers is slowly working through to the current day. And I'll be very happy when I see, I think his next book is going to finish at World War One at the end of World War One, and then it's going to work on from there with another book. Um, what's holding you guys forward? Ah, that's what was holding it. There we go. That way then you're not going to get hit by my chair, are you? No, you're not. Ooh Take care, Mark Harkness. Enjoy walking the pups. Ah, uh, Toyota Hilux is a wonderful car, a wonderful thing to have. I have quite literally been off-roading in a Toyota Hilux and ended up in a scenario which was, this was all understood, I was doing some driver training um, course, which was an off-roading course actually in a Hilux, 
and we were going over a gravel surface, round bends, all those things, doing all those things at very high speed. And sideswiped a tree with my tailgate. Should have shouted timber at that point because the tree went down, the tailgate was fine. No ebook for Command of the Ocean. No, because it's so massive it would break Kindle. That's it, really. It's so massive it would break Kindle. Spirit of the Harwich Force. Yeah. It's saying I should insert an ad now. You know what? I'm getting tempted to do it just to actually see what happens if I insert an ad. But no, uh, finding a copy of this book is very, very difficult, but if you do, it's well worth reading. Mainly for the pictures. And for those of you who like C-Class Cruisers, there is HMS Central. Yeah, C-Class. Cute. Mm -hmm. And there is him as a 70-year-old man in the local defence volunteers. On March 9th, disappointed by almost a month with only one or two abortive sallies, Tirit wrote to Keys, The Harwich Force is not nearly so much in evidence now as our opposite numbers, the second scouting group, are just double our weight in guns and tons. I have very direct orders about not taking them on, but I have hopes of not being able to help it. I have always grudged Nelson's remark, only numbers can annihilate. He should have substituted guts for numbers. It was just as this juncture the growing dissatisfaction in the country with the Admiralty and a campaign that was being mounted for Fisher's return to it both came to a head when on March the 7th the First Lord made a statement in the Commons on the Navy estimates. He painted what in, sev in several respects was a much too rose-coloured picture of the situation which helped to provoke, Ch provoke Churchill to go to the other extreme in an outburst of denunciation of the Admiralty for an attitude of pure passivity. In particular, he declared that he could not understand their lack, uh, their lack of enterprise in dealing with the Zeppelin raiders, and asked amid cheers why we do not go out and destroy their sheds. When turrets, who had been trying and fighting almost a week, in a, week, a week in and week out for the past year to do just that, read the account of this speech, his former admiration for the speaker evaporated in an instant. He wrote to his wife, I hated Winston's reappearance and have wiped him off my list. He has done a bad piece of work and has made himself ridiculous in the world. As for old Fisher whose recall Ch Churchill had sta uh, staggered the house by urging, if he gets back, he'll create hell in the Admiralty and will do, no amount, uh, do any amount of harm. At sea, it was now the British turn to move, and on March the 25th and 26th, Turret's plan for an air attack on the Zeppelin base to exist at, uh, to exist, uh, supposed to exist at Hoya on the Shrewsbury coast was at last carried out, an even more daring raid than that of Christmas Day 1914 on Cuxhaven, because the approach was made in broad daylight. It's a very good book, and it's a very interesting account by a very interesting person. The fact that it's put together by A. Temple Peterson, who... How do I put this politely about Peterson? Mm, Patterson. Um, I always call him Peterson for some reason. Well, he was a professor who was, had access to the personal diaries and recollections of many of Titret's contemporaries, as well as the invaluable letters written almost daily by Truett to his wife during long periods when that grey mistress, his ship, kept them apart. He had access to information which you cannot get today. You cannot go and interview these people that he interviewed. You cannot go and talk to them. You can just read their writings. So you have to consider it very in intensively what he wrote. Oh, yeah, I, I will do something about the camera. And so when I get, there is, a, as said, I am 
the plan is to get a stabilized camera mount, uh, a stabilized camera with uh, as uh, we sort of mount as part of the, as the next thing to get, and uh, yeah, that should stop these shakes happening. I also plan to get a little thing shelf unit that I can mount on the shelving I have there so I can put the camera there or that might cause me to have to shift some things around but we'll see what we can do and it will of course mean you'll be staring down on me even more so I'll be looking up at you going hello everyone Sometimes, yes, they are. But Doctor, Cla but Doctor Cla a nice tribal class of state in the spirit of third battle Narvik is always a good way to go. Yes, and the thing about having Volvos is they tend to go places. Um, did uh, damn thing, did the ships ever get self-conscious about all the talk about their weight and how beamy they were, the shape of their stern act? No, they considered it natural for them. It's kind of like my um, corgi. Uh, where you start calling him Chonky and he starts wagging his tail. I say, would I uh, be right if Hood is firing Mark IV torpedoes at Dear Demosaurus? Doesn't Lugens have to worry he is under a submarine attack? More than likely. Because he can't presume he isn't. Michael Cooch, if the RN had been allowed to complete the G3s as aircraft carriers, what they would look like? And how they changed the RN carry development tactics? Y well. Seeing as they weren't as far along, actually, on the thing about the G3, what they would have looked like, I can actually answer that because someone very nicely put together for me a picture a while back, and I should have them somewhere. Give me a second to grab them. Uh, which one are they on? Are they on the blue one? Or are they in the red one? Well, then the red one, they're in there. But let's hope they're in the blue one. I think they're in the blue one. Ba da da bing. <whistles> yep. That goes that. And then plug that into that. Yep, we have that. Add source. No, I don't want you to do anything fancy. I do love that. Th th please let me just gla uh, bask in the glow of this because it used to be I wouldn't have dared do anything like that while I was running XSplit because the computer I was running on would have cried. And that would have been a problem. Whereas, well, this did it. Right, I've opened up the correct folder, I think. I think I have the correct one. Yeah, I have Pine Martin Emily's designs. In fact, I, I will I will put up both. I've got two. I've got C Dodder's one, which I'll put up there. And I'll add another one. So, 
as you can see, these are two sets of designs put together. Uh, this is the G3 Armada led by Hood. Uh, well, no, led by actually completed G3. With two renowns in the background, you know, just in case a G3 had been completed instead of Hood. And this, of course, is the G3 design put together by uh, Pine Martin Emily, based more on what I sort of suggested as a looking idea, because my theory is that, to an extent, that this was looked at as a conversion project in terms of an Admiral class to a um, to a carrier, because of the way that they phrased the, the reason why the... Um, Camelairs get the contract for building Ark Royal because they're considered to have carrier strike carrier design experience when frankly they shouldn't have because they haven't built anything before then and later the only thing they were building which could have been done was an Admiral class battle cruiser. How would they have impacted the development of Royal Navy carrier doctrine? They'd have given them something powerful to use something really powerful to use. Uh, you'd have seen something which had an air group along the size of what you could put in a Lexington available to the fleet air arm, which would probably have, a would have forced the probably the fleet air arm to be cut back under control of the Royal Navy far earlier, and b they would have therefore developed and evolved from there. So you, I still see them ending up with carriers which have armor as well as. Air group and uh, being a sort of slightly less air aircraft than the Americans, but you know slightly more protected. But I see them having a lot more aircraft than they do have, and I see the British fighting for having more tonnage for carriers, and being carriers being an increasingly important part of their ability to deter and maximise force. It would be it'd be something the British would look at very quickly when you had such big ships as carriers. As hang on, those are able to maximise our force protection our presence and our ability to influence events. So I hope you enjoyed that. I do love those pictures. I'm going to leave them up there for a bit. Yay, I have pictures above me. Coming up, Doc, if the arc roll survived the torpedoing, which it might have done if actually the damage control had been done correctly. And put in for a pair refit. Do you think she would have been sent as USS Robin, USS Robin instead? Um, potentially. Potentially she's available to do so. But potentially she's also, instead of being going USS Robin, if she would be going to the Far East Fleet, to the Eastern Fleet, and being part of that. And it might be that you'd have Ark Royal, Illustrious, and, you know, you'd have three carriers, including Ark Royal. And you still have the Indy? Probably. You probably still have Indomitable, Illustrious, and you probably have Ark Royal as your third carrier in the Eastern Fleet under Somerville. In which case, that would be what would be taking on Operation C. And that's starting to make the scenario very, very different. Because if you've got three fast carriers, three big carriers as your core, you can do some far nastier operations. So, Johnson, I know you started with a glass of milk. I was tardy, but I was just at a bowl. Have you eaten out yet today? Yes, I cooked roast pork for lunch, and um, I also just had some chicken nuggets. So, you know, I've eaten plenty. Don't worry. Thank you. Ingenious Iron, if you were shopping for a super sports car, what would you get? Um, I love Porsche 911. It's that. But, um, probably a Mustang. I know. I. I do like the Aston Martin. I always have liked the Aston Martin, but for some reason, there's always been part of me that's enjoyed the Mustang, even though probably in the UK, it would be a nightmare for going around corners. Night Americans, how capable would an Admiral carrier be? I imagine it would depend on how you built it. Decker's hood finished, so I'm asking is, well, how would you build an Admiral carrier in the real world? Well, oh, let me add another source to add another picture to show you, because I have one. 
Da 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 da. Because the lovely sea daughters. Produce this as well. Yep. There you go. That's what Hood with three Admiral class carriers around her would look like. Now, we can all be fairly certain that that is not a nice arrangement. Now, I have to say I disagree with the two lift arrangement and a two center line lift because I think it, the, the reason why the British went with center line lifts along courageous and glorious etc was because it was very difficult once you'd already built up a ship to build the strength into the hull to have deck edge lifts and they did look at deck edge lifts whereas with these vessels because they'd be building them basically from the hull up They'd be able to build something even longer, because you can imagine they could extend up their flight deck and the hull even further out so they could have one massive hangar. But they could also put in a deck edge lift. Now, I this is an interesting debate that go, people go, sort of, what do you expect it going to happen? Would they have a deck edge lift both sides? I think they would have... I think they would have had a centerline lift forward, and I think they'd have had a deck edge lift aft. Because that's what they were looking at. So I think that's how they'd have been formed up. Probably, possibly they've ended up with three lifts rather than two. But no. It's a very nice look and it does give you something interesting to sort of consider. Bada -ba -bing. Professor, Dr. Clark, British warship classification is confusing. Why not name it after first ship and class? Usually it is, but there's sometimes a debate as to which is the first ship of the class. And sometimes these things are done on which ship is ordered first rather than which ship is actually delivered first. Or which ship is launched first rather than which ship is commissioned first. Or which ship is commissioned first rather than which is launched and which is ordered first. It all depends on who's in charge of naming that point. RG, a book that can break candle. I'm impressed. The only time I got anywhere near that was a 230 slide presentation that broke the PDF reader in Microsoft presentation. Oh, yeah. Tony Verka, uh, Dr. Clark, when Churchill ordered in first pause in carry construction and capital ship construction, remember he ordered both, in order to build more escorts, what did he hope to gain apart from more escorts? That was it, more escorts. That's what he was aiming for, more escorts. Because, principally, he thought that he was basically refighting World War One, And you can understand him, from that perspective. It does look like it's World War One shaping up again. And, yeah. If you're just fighting Germany, you have enough resources. If you're fighting Italy as well as Germany, then there's problems. If you're fighting Japan, Italy, and Germany, then you are scuppered by that decision. But it makes sense. Professor, were there naval counterparts of Dear Weir and Mad Jack Churchill? Uh, Philip Vian springs to mind. There's a few others as well. Some, um, a fair number of us.
Anok, did you record your computer build? I did record it, and I'll be putting a video together at some point, and I'll come out probably over the Christmas period as a special at some point. Uh, come on, guys. Can you tell us the Vietnamese Ajax joke? I mean, the Hungarian army got the first uh, KF-41 links yesterday. That was a Drax joke, but basically his thinking was that if they sent an Ajax out, to, uh, Ajax out to Vietnam, it'd break down and end up being put in there a museum of useless Western things. I said, would you agree the British had it worse rebuilding a military from the ground up? They weren't rebuilding their military from the ground up. That's the thing. The British weren't. And that actually creates more complexity than actually building up a military from the ground up. I keep my Kindle in motorbike panniers as it is lightweight and more damp resistance than carrying a book when going for a ride. Very sensible. Plus, one of the things that we once advertised was a Kindle that could be read underwater, but I was never quite sure if it would work. I never tested it out. Uh, Nighttime Reflections. An odd question. To you and everyone, really. I saw a German or Norwegian documentary from around 1960 on Norway campaign, at least 40 minutes long, featuring footage of Warspike charging into Narvik and firing guns. Thought I saved it clearly, you didn't. Did you or anyone here in the chat know of this documentary? Yes, I've heard of it. No, I haven't managed to get hold of it. I've heard there's this this footage going around, but I've never managed to get hold of it. <laughs> Come on, guys, with G3 carrier, possibly twin engine aircraft? For both that and the Admiral class, there's a possibility of twin engine aircraft. At what point did a jet air wing become more preferable to a prop ones? Mid fifties, probably mid sixties, rather mid fifties. There still is uh, you still have a mixture of aircraft well into mid six, uh, well into the mid sixties, and there are still advantages to having propeller aircraft right into the mid sixties, especially their ability to operate in certain operate in certain conditions and certain roles. Hey, John Luke. If the RRN gets Admiral CV plus extra tonnage, would increased battleship tonnage have been argued for also? Fast nail roads in numbers 5 to 7, plus early development of larger DDs. Um, they'd have tried for it, but it's an option of whether or not they get it or not. It might well change what you pick for your nail rod. If you're getting bigger, faster carriers... Then you might well hang on, think, hang on, we need more than just Hood, Renown, Repulse. And this is the interesting picture, of course. This one has Hood, Renown, Repulse, and the three um, Admiral class carriers. You probably only get two, but if you did get three, then it becomes very much... Kind of, uh, the British were very much going, hang on, these three ships are kind of important. So they're going to become the focus of the upgrade, but also it's going to be a case of, hang on, what are we going to replace them with? And it might well be the case that you pick a different design. You might go for a full 55,000 ton Nelson Nelrod design and use those extra 1,200 or so tons to put in extra engine power to try and get you some more speed, because an extra 1,200 tons could probably buy you another couple of knots, so it can make you faster. Might buy them even more than that, depending on how efficient you manage to get the engines going. Because remember, there's the rear, there's the top theoretical top speed on the nail rods, and there's thanks to their efficient hull, uh, their eff very efficient hull design, the real top speed on the nail rods, which Nizer now finds out. So if you did manage to buy them three or four knots, let's say you get them up to twenty-eight knots not beyond the realms of possibility with the extra 1200 tons of engine power being delivered um, that's probably an extra prop shaft at least one extra prop shaft maybe even go for two, two extra prop two extra shafts to so go for a four shaft design you might also modify them a bit 
you're probably going for a slightly longer hull anyway, so you probably you might change the guns around a bit. Um, that could give you the world's first fast battleship. Could do. Okay, Mustang or V8 or the turbo full bang with a six-speed millennial anti-theft design, I presume. Um, as much as I love what's quoted as the millennial anti-theft anti device, which is a lovely thing, but actually most people I know, millennials I know in the UK, etc., most of them I teach, actually can use a stick shift and can use a driver manual car. Admittedly, I do teach quite a lot of engineers, but they can. I'd probably get, there is one which has, a ver well there's a version I've been re I read about the other day where they have a flappy paddle gearbox and it's hooked up to an automatic gearbox so you can stick it in automatic or run it in manual using the flappy paddles and that seems sensible to me because if I had it and I had something that comfortable to drive around in. I'd want to be able to do motorway cruising and urban traffic in. So I'd want to be able to go into automatic because the most frustrating thing known to mankind is shifting one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. One, two. I hate you, one, two, one, two. So that's why I have an automatic. That's why I drive an automatic. I always have, I, you know, Subarus, etc., and all the other things, I have, they're all Geartronic, in that, my, if you consider my last Subaru, that could be stuck in D, in drive, or I could go, click, and, uh -oh, push it forward, and that would take me up a gear, and pull it back, and that would take me down a gear, and so, that was sort of how I'm used to operating. I do like the classic Mustang, but let's be honest, probably in the UK I'd go from one and one. Just something, got distracted watching Mysteries of the Deep. I hope it was a good one. Interesting. Isn't it supposed to be the battleship defending the carriers, not a fleet of carriers keep trying to keep the battleship alive? It's both. Both support each other. Lions, do you think any? Do you have any good audiobook recommendations? So I don't think most days are available. Um, most of these are not available. But I have been talking with Prof about this one, and there is a potential of it being done as an audiobook by someone very, very um, celebrity. Mikey Newman, Mustangs ain't that bad in corners. No. Ken Stewart, you've been a member for four months. Churchill forgot the war could spread. Churchill forgot many things about the war. That would have worked for me. I'm planning on buying it in black anyway. Mm-hmm. Damn, these slides are cool. Uh, uh, cool ships, I see, and cool images. Or uh, uh, cool images are those which he likes. They are. They were done by Pine Martin Emily and C. Dodders. Uh, really nice, and they're from the Washington Treaty issue summary. So if you go and look for the Washington Treaty Issues uh, Treaty Issues series, you'll find them all in there. We have a full discussion on them. Mm-hmm.
Archie, I recognize the two Armada pictures were made in Naval Art, Lisa, I think so. I think so as well. They are done well. They do look good. Right, Dr. Clark, uh, granted the Americans didn't have many options when they hit Japan with carrier based speed running hoves. Did the RNFA consider doing something similar to mosquitoes? Yes. They did. But it was a case of finding a spare carrier. It's the whole tr the whole thing for British in World War Two is finding a carrier. They know how useful they are. They've done exercises with how useful they are, but um, they just haven't got enough available. They never have enough. They start off the war by losing two in quick succession. Um, glorious and courageous, which is their two biggest and most worked up carriers. They lose, and that's a ouch. And they just never really recover from that. They start World War Two as the largest carrier power in the world, the most carriers, the most. Uh, they start the most carriers, the most carrier experience, and they lose their two most experienced assets with all those personnel aboard, and that's what happens to them. Nice Aaron, Do the British even have a twin-engine design 1920s that's viable as a carrier plane? No, but there again, they don't have carriers. AKDs, which are actually big enough for them to really make use of one. Whereas if you had, especially an Admiral class carrier, because that would actually be bigger than a G3, you'd have space for it. So now for the top right slide. So I'm presuming this one. Would you have um, six, uh, four towns or six travel seamen? You probably have six towns and oh you probably want every single tribal you could get your hands on for that but you probably have a flotilla of tribals and a flotilla of jays because each one where you'd want to be a task group would be carrier uh, carrier battle cruiser two towns and well, as said, uh, two J's and two tribals. All the best, uh, all the best to Mrs. Stewart, Glenn. Take care. Have fun. We still learn to drive man as a sound. Yep. Come on, Cameron. Do, uh, Doc, if the Admiral G3 carriers were built, do you think we would see longer range destroyers being built earlier as part of the escort group? I.e. tribals, but a decade earlier. Um, probably not. Probably not. There's always a possibility, but it's probably not. Um, It's a case of you might see them, but it would be the destroyers you'd probably see would be different, and it might well be a case of especially. It's this is going to sound strange, but with it just being being a ten thousand ton limit, you might see destroyers being the destroyers might, that are in, coming into service, and they they base the restrictions of for the London treaties on could be very different. So it it would probably be something you'd see with more four inch guns and probably get twin four inch guns and probably more torpedoes. So you'd see something more like well an, a sort of battle class, a proto battle class, or even proto daring class earlier on. Than a tribal, etc. The tribal is a compromise to do a long range gun destroyer in an era where you've got the treaty limitations. If you start off early, it's going to be bigger.
<coughs> Again, do not get iron brew up your nose. I wasn't sure if I asked before, is it really fair to call ships like um, Hood a white elephant? No, because they're not a white elephant. They're perfectly sensible for what they do. Uh, Rapper is back. In the visual range gunfight, does 2 3 knots really make much of a difference? At flank speed running parallel, it would make, take the faster ship 2 to 3 hours to reach the horizon and 7 knots uh, to clear gun range. It does make a difference. It makes a difference of getting into gun range. And it allows you to dictate when you do get into gun range. So you're thinking about them starting off running parallel and then being in a race. But that no battle actually starts out that way. It starts out with them spotting each other on the horizons. And you racing to catch this one up. But if they're faster, they decide when they're going to get engaged. But if you're faster than this one, then you can catch up with them. So that's what you're dealing with. That That's the thing. Speed decides when the... It doesn't really change the engagement. It allows you to control when the engagement is. And look. Grease Marine had problems with their high-pressure steam plants. What pressures did they run? Um, I know USN had 600 PSI plants in Model 2. What did the RN use? The RN didn't use high-pressure plants. And I, I can explain this in, in one example. I've been talking about this a lot and... You'll hear this line in Tuesday's video when I talk about the hyperdrive, the Asgard hyperdrive in the Deadless class. The Deadless class with the Asgard hyperdrive are very capable ships. They're able to go very, very fast. The thing is, they have, they are kind of like the British warships in World War II. They're given the latest and greatest turbines, which could actually take a far higher power of steam pressure than they're fitted with. The reason the British fit the boilers that they already have in mass production, they already have the training, etc. things for, because they want to get a fleet out to sea as quickly as possible. So they're putting these boilers in. But they do have plans and ideas for in future, we'll take those boilers out, we'll put in higher pressure boilers, we already have the turbines which can take that pressure. So that's part of the British planning from about nine, from the 1930s, mid-1930s onwards. It's going. To, it's it's a sort of real scenario, but it means that the Americans are probably, in terms of reliable high pressure, it's the Americans who are the uh, the winners in World War Two. John Luke, so Nelrod being the first fast battleship at twenty knots plus knots. Surprise! I'm here to ruin your day. Two two uh, two knots. How much faster will that, uh, that get with a red racing stripe and the clones of Captain Darrell Hampton on those ships? Don't ask, but let's put it this way. If Nelrods were capable of doing 28 knots, then Nisenau doesn't get away that day. Nisenau doesn't get away that day. But also, it changes your orientation, because if you have them capable of 28 knots, if you think about it, then you're not relying on Hood, Renown, and Repulse for all your high-speed operations. In World War Two, you suddenly have well. Do I have to call back Hood to run along with Prince of Wales, or does Nelson and Rodney, or Nelson and Rodney, do it? And that's the other thing. Does Bismarck then get caught by Prince of Wales and let's say HMS Nelson? In which case, there's going to be no lucky shot because Nelson is not designed. It isn't a battleship, not a battle cruiser. You ain't getting a lucky shot on the bat that battleship. You ain't getting that golden BB. And that's nine 16 inch guns going, Hello! <laughs> Hello! How are you? Oh, you can't run away! Oh, well. <laughs> Let us parte, my friend. Let us parte. And that's just not a nice experience for a poor ship, you know. There's not, there's, there's no reason why poor Bismarck should be subjected to such cruelty and unusual punishment. Darius <laughs> Radsky, mosquitoes were tested out, and that's why they have the Dehaven torn it. True. Um, Come guess with towns, tribals, and Jay's escort, and a Dido or two. Yep, that's a scary amount of firepower. It would work. <laughs> uh, 
Let's have some of them. Uh, six towns. Ah, uh, yes, tribals. Yes, all of them. Why was I thinking I'd get a different answer? Well, it, 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 it's only one flotilla. There are two flotillas of tribals. Technically, technically, you could go for 12 tribals and, you know, all, all both flotillas of tribals and two flotillas of jays and, and just put them all together. But, you know, that would be making a fleet which would... Well, let's be honest, with those 32 destroyers and those three ships at their core plus the three carriers at their core, that would be a strong enough force to probably hold the Indian Ocean against all comers. Now, Herman Brockton's, how would one hood free admiral carriers affect UK dock infrastructure? Would we get bigger dry docks? If so, that's something that could affect long iron ship design up to present day. You probably would have to, because if it, the admiral's more than G3s. Remember, G3s are designed to deal with existing dock, uh, dock super infrastructure. Um, hood, there were two or three dry docks available for her, including the one in Malta. If you have three ships, which uh, four ships in service, which need all those big dry docks. They would have to do some work on dry docks, so they would do some infrastructure work. Might even do work in the Far East, but probably do some work in the UK as well. I said, why do people call ships white elephant? Because people are short sighted, inherently so. Yeah, I was talking about the Daedalus class Stargate SG One <sighs> battle cruisers. That's what for, that's what Tuesday's battle cru uh, cruiser is. <laughs> Alfred B. Two Is there anything you would have excited to see now that Texas is out of water and we can see parts of hull we normally don't see? Uh, get a look. I was very excited to see her keel line. I was rather interested to see how that had held up. Uh, Re two to three knots advantage. See Battle of Coronel. Hmm? Staff Thompson. What I hate about video games, they seriously need to rework engagement range spawning under fire control. You would love, um. Oh, Supreme Commander. You would love. Uh, Stafford, you would love Supreme Commander if you like that. It's all about engagement ranges and sensor ranges. And it doesn't matter if you have the longest range artillery on the map. If you don't have any sensor data, you ain't firing it. So it goes back to a Sultan of Arabia who would give white elephants to people who annoyed him as the paying to the upkeep would cause them to go bankrupt. Very sensible, but if you're important enough to get given a white elephant by a Sultan of Arabia, the odds are you could always just gift it to him, you know, gift it to a zoo, or alternatively have enough money to actually pay for it. <laughs> Paul Bessick, for those questioning fleet air arm twin engine possibilities, look up the Bristol Bowfighter. Used as anti-shipping aircraft from Malta and New York, Guinea, and they're very effective. I think those are indicative. Yep. Congress, they're 28 non rods, but then do Shan Horse and Nisenau get built in their historical form? You have to remember there are limitations on Shan Horse and Nisenau are the limitations of Germany's maritime industry. So yeah, they probably do build them in their build them slightly different from a historical form. But you must remember the example that I'm talking about was when Nisenau was practically stopped. And it's only once she gets above 26 knots that she starts making headway away from Rodney charging down on her. So if Rodney's higher speed is able to do 28 knots, it's going to take even longer for Nisenau to reach 29 knots. And that means she's going to be well within the engagement range of Rodney's guns for all that time, which means she's probably going to get hammered.
That's the scenario we're talking about. And if they are made faster, then you have to make compromises elsewhere. Because if you're making them faster, they're either going to take longer to build and be more expensive, or you have to start making differences in their designs. And remember, Knights and Owls and Scharnhorst are two are probably two of the most two of the more efficient ships the German Navy actually procures for World War Two. But if you're making them faster, they ain't going to be any easier to build. Frank Spider, do you think that Church has a positive or a negative impact model? Positive, positive. I'm already him matching the scene you just said in As I Alone with Rodney and Wells, with Rodney telling Bismarck she has a price to pay for and Rodney has come to collect. Um, in the nicest way, it would be more of a case of Rodney going, Hello. Have you met my captain? He's called Dalrymple Hamilton. He's currently standing there going, Faster! 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 We will go faster! And the crew are going, just don't say the next word. Don't say the R word before speed, sir. Just, let me see. You suggested ramming speed? Running speed! I am in an armoured canoe. Amy for Bismarck. In other news today, Bismarck, uh, the, 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 uh, the, KMS Bismarck has ran her sh rammed herself ashore trying to escape uh, HMS Rodney, which was trying to ram her. Because she felt that just using the guns was not honourable. I just started reading Raymond's piece based on your recommendation. Ah, oh, cool. Hope you're enjoying it. Right then, let's add in and I guess go to our next book, which is British Naval Intelligence through the 20th century. So let me just check the timing before I put it in. Uh, 0208. And... Uh, oh, 25 plus 8 equals 33. So that's 16 and a half, which added on to that should be 51 and 30. Right. So, British Naval Intelligence through the 20th century by Andrew Boyd. Now, I know what you all want to hear me talking about, so I'm going to just look it up in the index and see if I can find the correct page. There's always a question, can he find a page? Oh, what do you know? 308 to 309, I think, is the right, from, from, is the right one. Whilst the Admiralty was broadly right up to the end of 1939, the limits to IJN growth posed by Japan's industrial and shipyard capacity, it got key aspects of the IJN shipbuilding program and thinking behind it wrong. First, like the Americans, it completely missed the super battleship program. Two 45,000 ton ships with 16 inch armament, it believed Japan had laid down in 1937, were actually Yamoto Moshashi displacing 72,000 tons and armed with 18.1 inch guns. Japanese interest in 18 inch guns was a talking point in the naval attache community around 1937 and reflected in the secret intelligence service is reporting, but a consensus was that it had not moved beyond a research phase. The IJN anticipated that this highly secret Yamoto program would provide a decisive quality advantage to defeat a more numerous American opponent. Secondly, 
primarily because of SIS reports beginning in 1957, the Admiralty believed the IGN was planning up to four battlecruisers around 20,000 tonnes armed with 12-inch guns. This programme, which gripped the Admiralty until the end of 1941, had some under underlying substance. From 1934, the IJN genuinely contemplated such ships to replace the Congos, but serious design work on the B-65s did not begin until 1939 and none were ever laid down. Mirroring also played a part here. Since the French and Germans built such ships, Naval Intelligence Division was inevitably susceptible to the idea that the IGN would do so too, when the SAS then pressed to seek evidence. The enthusiasm which SIS agents reported the existence of battlecruisers or pocket battleships with specifications similar to Germany smacks of agents reporting what case officers had told them to look for and therefore presumably wanted to hear. The battlecruiser fiction also reflected an enduring Royal Navy conviction that during any war with Britain, the IJN would determine the attacker trade, for which such ships would be eminently suited. In reality, the IJN never planned or pursued such a strategy. The Yamato programme represented a huge industrial commitment, preventing simultaneous construction of other heavy ships. It's not possible for, to begin the next two ships until mid-1940, and also limited carrier construction. The IJN laid down only two fleet carriers between mid-1937 and mid-1941, whereas the Royal Navy laid down six. The IJN laid down no cruiser from the beginning of 1936 until mid-1940. The Royal Navy, 32. The only major error in Dankwerk's uh, estimate of IJN strength for 1942, remember that name? Dankwerk's. We are talking about him earlier, going off to Washington lay in assuming Japan would build four more conventional battleships and battlecruisers rather than the two monsters. The Admiralty's two intelligence failures here did not ultimately matter. Its capital ship and carrier investment program underway in 1929 took adequate account of what Japan could realistically build, but was more achievable and balanced within available resources and much more suited to the real needs of modern naval war. Our intelligence failures of the IJN in, in, in the late 1930s were more damaging. The most important were missing the development of the advanced Austrian-powered wakeless long-range Type 93 long lance torpedo deployed from cruisers from 1935 and destroyers from 1940, and the effort the IJNAF was devoting to torpedo attack at long range by its new land-based bombers, such as the Type 96. Naval Intelligence Division received some early pointers on Type 93 in 1934, when it was still in development, from the Assistant Naval Attaché, Lieutenant Commander George Ross, following his visit to the Tora Torpedo School. On the specifications Ross had gleaned, NID thought it too large to be a viable destroyer weapon, and the intense secure secrecy surrounding its subsequent deployment precluded further intelligence, although SIS apparently briefed their Kobe agent, Ernest James, on the requirement. NID exploited one other source on the IJN in the late 1930s, submarine surveillance. The submarines Regulus and Rainbow, operating from Hong Kong, each conducted two successive intelligence gathering patrols in Japanese waters in October and November 1939, respectively. Regulus's first patrol po po focused on the Bungo Channel, the strait separating the islands of Kyushu and Tsukoku, giving access to the inland sea. It involved significant contact with the IJN combined fleet, producing valuable photographic intelligence of major units. Some of these photographs were later found by ja the Japanese in Singapore following its fall in 1942. Regulus spent a week in the, Beng in the Bungo Channel. She sighted the carry Ryujo on the 8th of October, dived to avoid another carrier the following day, and manoeuvred to close the Japanese fleet on the 11th of October. She covertly observed an IJN exercise, including a brand new Japanese carrier, almost certainly the Hiryu. Simultaneously, the submarine Perseus patrolled the Kia Strait on South Osaka Bay and 150 miles to the east. She did not encounter any IGN vessels and was tasked primarily against suspected German merchant traffic. The Japanese later disco discovered that Regulus had entered Shushu Shibushi Bay and Osaka Bay via the Kitan Strait, all producing photographic intelligence, although it is not certain whether these incursions occurred in October or November 1939 or during previous patrols. Such intelligence patrols were apparently frequent in the late 1930s and foreshadowed a major role of the post-1945 Royal Navy submarine service. They continued until all Royal Navy submarines were drawn from the Far East in mid-1940. Regulus undertook a third patrol in December 1939, this time to the area around Vladivostok. Primary objectives were to collect intelligence on Russian submarines and their operations, and search for any evidence of Russian submarines being taken over by the German Navy, as one intelligence report has suggested. Surviving records of these intelligence operations confirmed that the 15 submarines of the 4th Flotilla were efficient and effective, presenting a major threat to IJN seaborne invasion forces. Significantly, Japanese and Russian anti-submarine measures were assessed to be as feeble. Had Royal Navy submarines remained in the Far East after mid-1940, they might have corrected some of the intelligence errors regarding new IJN warships. The substantial US Navy submarine force with their Asiatic fleet could have also contributed here, but they were never used in this way, and apparently lacked necessary aggression and risk-taking. This is a very good book. It's a very well put together book. I'm not quite sure about some of the points it makes about the Americans, 
But there again, the Americans did fire quite a lot of their submarine commanders at the beginning of World War II because they weren't aggressive enough. So there could be something to do in, in what he was writing. Now, it's occurring. Uh, uh, Prince Jürgen would make a break for it if Romney and Wales were closing in. Possibly. Just want delay long enough to get T3 and specials online. Mm-hmm. Tino, what if the North Carolina fought Bismarck? Not fun for Bismarck. Um, Alfred B228, if I built a sci-fi Romney, I'm now going to have to give her a ram bow for that after that demonstration. It's it's perfectly normal for her to have a ram bow. Um, as assured, the Germans wouldn't have let out Bismarck without Tirpitz in the case that they might be facing a 28 knot nail rod. Well, the thing is, in that case, if you've got Bismarck and running around with Tirpitz at the same time and they're running around together, then the odds are they would find themselves facing a... the British would not let them uh, face us they would not be facing a scenario where it was two ships versus t t two ships so it'd be nelson and rodney plus king george v uh, king george v's etc so let's be honest you'd have nelson and rodney and king george of uh, king george v hood prince of wales as your a group you'd be drawing from so it'd be any sort of combination of the any a sort of combination of a three of those be there. Not fun in any scenario. Come on, guys, ramping up a one engine production didn't work for the USSR, not to mention the capitalist Reich. Italy, GB, and USA had to pay for indu uh, pay industrial owners. Hmm. Nice, everyone. Did Admiral Lutyens ex accept, uh, expect Jürgen to do much, given a convoy guided by a revenge or a good iron cruiser is one it will avoid? Not really, then. Not really. But it was hoped that it would cause a diversion of attention. Ah, sure. How much did the R class make a difference in protecting the convoys? Well, again, it's the glass jaw, a jaw syndrome. Because if I'm a surface raider, let's be honest, if I'm a Deutschland class or an Admiral Hipper class, I go up against an R class, any R class, it's got 15 inch guns. I'm in the range that's going to probably hit me because it's got well practiced crews, and yes. They haven't necessarily got the latest systems and the latest upgrades, but they've got the best targeting systems the British can give them in terms of visual systems, and some of them do get that they did get the radar upgrades, etc. In which case, they're probably going to hit me, in which I'm going to get damaged, and frankly, I could end up getting sunk if I get within gun range of that R class, which means I don't really want to go anywhere in that convoy. If I'm a Scharnhorst. I probably don't want to fight an R-Class one-on-one, -on -one, but even if I'm two of me fighting an R-Class, the odds are we're going to take enough damage that we ain't going to get away from it. We might win and destroy the convoy, but the odds are we both get sunk because the other ships which will catch us when we go away. So that's the point. It's a glass draw syndrome for the surface raiders. It's a case of, hang on, that's a level of threat which we don't want to deal with because there's no way we get out of that without getting damaged. Without getting our jaw at least cracked. Gone Cameron. Doc, the question I have, given the UK-Japanese intelligence alliance was in effect until the Washington Naval Treaty, did Japanese officers get a look at Furious while she still had her guns? Probably, the naval attaché did. So, how long would it take for the RN to build 32 Type 26s? Oh my lord. A very long time. Um, it would depend. If building them at the current rate of production... Oh, three to four decades. If building them at the most efficient rate of production we could probably achieve, less than that. M167A. Calling the Third Reich capitalist is stretching it a bit. Remember, it's not called National Socialism for nothing. I suppose you could call it crony capitalism, but it's hardly a free market. And it's 
it's complicated. As as Shaw says, it's not socialism. It's not it, the Third Reich is 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 fascist economics taken to the extreme. So the Americans are an example of putting your eggs into one basket and the hiding basket. Yep. Hi, Melanie. <laughs> right. Oh. And next one we have, and this is another good Christmas buy. This is another good Christmas buy, definitely. Ew. Two. Twenty-one. Oh, Dan Freeman, I think the key thing about naval intelligence by Japan was crucially not showing anything the RN needed to change doctrine build plans for. The RN could build more ships or something uh, threatened. Mm hmm. Minus o'clock, you recommended uh, recommend many well researched books, but there are many. Uh, are there any books commonly found in naval users' li libraries you suggest removing or at least relabeling as fiction? Um. I will remind you of the policy I have established for a long time, mainly from the perspective, and this was hard learnt in my own PhD thesis. I talk about books if I like them or if I think they have something useful to learn from. If I don't like them and don't think they have something useful to learn from, I don't mention them. This is partially because some of these books are written by my friends. In the case of Prof. Lambert's books, they're written by my old PhD supervisor. In the case of other cases, they're written by people who were, let's put it this way, do not respond well to constructive criticism. So, this is the new reprinted version of A Sailor's Odyssey, by, uh, which was the autobiography written by Admiral Andrew Cunningham. I have an original edition, and I have this. This version is available to be bought now, and I do think, if Glenn's watching, this might be, C4 publication, available in, let me just check, in digital download in Kindle. Yep, you can get A Sailor's Odyssey in Kindle version. So if Glyn, if you watch this in later, you can get this in, in Kindle. Paperback is £18.75 in the UK. Kindle is £7.99. Its print length is 1,068 pages. And it is a lovely book. It is Andrew Cunningham's life story as written by Andrew Cunningham. And you also find in here pictures from his own personal collection. HMS Malaya being bombed by the Italians, um, as he describes it, coming through a forest of Italian bombs.
Right then, let's go for... Ah, oh, well, this should be interesting. Our estimate of the German air strength in the Mediterranean at this period was 100 dive bombers, 150 long-range bombers, and 50 reconnaissance aircraft. This considerable strength seemed to indicate that they were contemplating something more important than an attack upon our sea communications. It rather looked as though Hitler, fearing an Italian collapse, intended to come to their assistance by starting large-scale operations in the Mediterranean. Meanwhile, from various reports, we began to suspect the arrival of the Luftwaffe in the Dodecanese. And sure enough, the Suez Canal was attacked on the night of January the 18th, 19th. There were neither damage nor casualties, but the canal traffic had to be held up for 24 hours because of unexploded bombs. The first attack on the canal made us rather apprehensive. Except for the far ships, the route through the Mediterranean must be abandoned for the time being. Were the enemy going to try and close, uh, closing our back door also? It was essential that all the convoys com coming around the Cape and up the Red Sea were re with reinforcements supplies to the army should use the canal. Alexandria was the only port in Egypt with facilities for dealing with a large volume of shipping. And about this time, Colonel Donovan from the United States launched lunch with me on board Warspite. He'd been travelling around Europe, sizing up the situation had just come from the Balkans. I found him a most pleasant and interesting man, very much alive. We talked about the naval situation in the Mediterranean, and he offered to send a message to the United States saying they must let us have some fighter aircraft. I did nothing to discourage him. We had long been considering a command operation in the Dodecanese. The idea was to take Casso, the island near Scarpento off the eastern end of the crate, which would have given us both sides of the Casso Straits, always the uh, scene of much U-boat and E-boat activity. Furthermore, we intended mounting a gun or two on Casso to command the airfield at Scapanto. But for some reason, the chief staff at home vetoed the operation. We regretted it, as subsequent events showed the occupation of Casso would have paid a dividend. However, a little later in January, there came an instruction from the chief staff at home telling us they had been considering the situation caused by the arrival of Luftwaffe in the Mediterranean and refusal of the Greeks of any direct military aid. It was the opinion that an attack should be planned on the Dodecanese, particularly on roads, so as to secure our position on the Aegean. This certainly fell in with my views, though I could not see where the troops or other resources were to come from, especially as they also stressed the importance of capturing Benghazi. For this, uh, for this Dodecanese project, the three specially equipped assault ships, Glenern, Glengale and Glen Royal, were also to be sent to us. Meanwhile, all was going well ashore. General Platt was advancing in southern Sudan, and my brother was starting to move south of Abyssinia. In the western desert, the army was pausing preparatory to the assault on Tobruk. The inshore squadron, under the command of the Captain Harold Hickling, had been giving all possible help in bombarding, evacuating prisoners, landing supplies, and so on. On January 19th, I was able to report to the Admiralty that, in spite of bad weather, the inshore squadron in the last 10 days had ferried 35,000 Italian prisoners of war to Alexandria, besides supplying stores to Solom and Bradia, and the rate of 500 tons daily and clearing both those harbours for traffic. Preparations had also been made for using the harbour at Tobruk as soon as possible after its capture. A small ship laden with everything necessary for this purpose was kept at Solom, ready to move on when the assault started. It's a very, very good book to read, and a lot of fun. Jeff, I gave that to my father for his birthday earlier this year, and this year, and he is currently reading it, lol. Cool. After B-228, I've always been intrigued by USS Olympia. She's a protector cruiser. Are you sure she's a protector cruiser? With guns you would expect to see on an armored cruiser. Why did we not see more protected cruisers similar to her? Too expensive? Olympia is a long-range commerce cruiser designed for solo action. That means she's kind of special as I discussed about her when I'm talking about um, the Spanish-American War of 1899 the castle I've been waiting for a reprinting of a sailor's odyssey it's been many years now since I managed to obtain the loan of a copy through library services so many books where to put another bookcase it's a good one to have it's got lots of good pictures in it I seem to be only at book six or twelve. Ugh, and it's nine thirty. Hmm. We'll get through some of these.
My secretary is everyone. How do you kill off the extensions of the Battleship Hold Day? A non signatory power needs to launch a large battleship. A large and powerful ship, which immediately, sca uh, which immediately changes things. The only option for that is, for some reason, the Soviet Union needs to actually launch a battleship which has 12 16 inch guns and displaces slightly more than the, uh, the treaty tonnage. They'll claim it's, they claim it's 35,000 tons in standard, but none of the treaty powers will believe them with 12 16 inch guns. All of them will look at them and go, You're lying. We know you're lying. You lie. Take care, Richards. Oh, two. 31. So, Decline of British Sea Power by Desmond Wetton. I do not think you can find a new copy of this book. Um, I have a copy of this book because a very kind friend gave it to me. And it is all about the Royal Navy post World War II. So, let's start off in 1951, because it's always good to start off in a year which people forget. At the December 1950 meeting of the North Atlantic Council, the British government gave a pledge to increase and accelerate defence measures. By April 1951, 6,000 ratings from the Royal Fleet Reserve would have been recalled for 18 months active service, in addition to some 600 officers drawn from the emergency list and RNVR and RNVSR who had served for the same period. As an indication of the gravity which the government regarded the aggressive attitude of the communist world, two tankers, the 7,600 gross ton Tatri and the ship, sister ship Beskidi, building at Sunderland for Poland, were seized. On completion, they joined the Royal Fleet Auxiliary under the names of Surf Patrol and Surf Pioneer. The previous year, a Chinese nationalist-owned tanker, which was lying at Hong Kong, had also been taken over by the RAF, RFA following Chinese communist attempts to claim her. The government statement expressed the hope that it would not be necessary to retain regulars for more than 18 months additional service. These measures would make it possible to commission more ships from reserve and to put the reserve fleet in a better state of readiness. New construction and conversion programs to meet the submarine and mine threats would also be greatly accelerated. Mr. Attlee told Parliament. In Korea, aircraft from the light fleet carrier Theseus kept up the attack on North Korean's line of communications. Firefly bombers destroyed nine road and rail bridges and blocked two rail tunnels, while sea fury fighters carried out numerous traffic attacks and cannon fire on enemy transports and troop columns. The performance of the Theseus Air Group was marked by the presentation to them of the Boyd Trophy and awarded annually to the most outstanding naval aviation unit. In the latter part of 1950, after some six months off Korea, Lieutenant w, uh, Lieutenant w. Noble, RN, made the air group's 2,500th 2, deck landing from, while Lieutenant A. Haggart, our Royal Marines, recorded the 1,000th consecutive landing to be made without incident. Because of the low wind speed over the deck, take off, deck on occasions, it was necessary to launch aircraft using RATO, rocket-assisted takeoff. Elsewhere in Korea, it was, in what was a bitterly cold winter, a landing party from the cruiser Salon carried out a very different task than when they gave medical aid, food and clothing, as well as cutting down trees for fuel for 20 orphan children living on an island on the west coast. American helicopters operating from the carriers had aroused considerable publicity in Korea by their rescuing of crews and of aircraft shot down behind enemy lines. But although Royal Navy carriers still had sea otter amphibians for search and rescue work, the helicopter's potential was not being ignored, and early in 1951, a naval dragonfly landed on a platform built on the stern of Royal Fleet Auxiliary Stores replenishment ship Fort Dunkers in the Channel. The aim was to test the feasibility of landing on a ship and carrying stores between ships at sea. The Sea Otter, a development of the venerable walrus amphibian known as the Shagbat, whose um, origins could be traced to the Seagull amphibian in the 1920s, 
was still capable of performing useful service. The, carrier's tri uh, the carrier Triumph Sea Otter, piloted by Lieutenant P. Kane, our Royal Navy, and navigated by air crewman First Class G.C. O'Neill, had flown 80 miles to the rescue departed from American naval aircraft who had ditched after being damaged off Korea. In the words of the First Lord of the Admiralty, statement on the 1951-52 estimates, the gallant rescue was carried out in sea conditions in which the landing of a sea otter aircraft would normally have been regarded as impossible, and has earned warm congratulations and praise from the United States Navy. The war in Korea was again demonstrating the lessons learned in the Second World War that the command of naval forces operating over a wide area should not be located in a ship actually involved in the fighting, where its role might interfere with the requirements of the command staff. So early in 1951, Vice Admiral W.G. Andrews, who commanded all the Commonwealth Naval Forces in Korea waters, began flying his flag in Ladybird, a converted Yangtze River steamer. It was officially stated that not only did this ship have communications equipment comparable to with that of a cr in a cruiser, but she was also responsible for the logistics support of ships with, from eight Commonwealth navies. Despite the growing commitment in Korea, it was still possible to muster... 18 ships for the home fleet's spring cruise for joint exercises of the Mediterranean fleet in February. The commander-in-chief, Admiral Sir Philip Vian, flew his flag in the battleship Vanguard, which was accompanied by the operational carrier Indomitable, the training carrier Indefatigable, the cruiser Swifter, nine destroyers, three frigates, and two submarines. Vian was kept away from Korea for fear that what might happen if he was let out there. In March, the Navy estimates aroused considerable interest and the Prime Minister himself announced plans to build some 300 new warships. The estimates totaled 278 million, an increase of 40% over the 1950 figure. 30% of the total was to be spent on new construction, while pay, food and clothing accounted for 28%, the dockyards for 10%, weapons for 9%, increased fuel stockpiles for 5%, and the Admiralty Office for under 2%. This is an amazing book, but getting hold of a copy is like, I don't know, tracking down hen's back teeth. It's really, really cool, but really difficult to get hold of. Yeah, it's lined up. Grand Contour Canal. Um, that was the one. The one that was the one for. No. Oh. Remind me of that one. I need a map of it. Yeah, that was the one which was supposed to be uh, basically a massive canal, which would have. Linked up Newcastle, the uh, Manchester, the whole country, Bristol. Um, it would have changed the movement of goods dramatically. It would have changed the movement of goods dramatically. What would it, if it had been if it had been present in World War Two? Uh, it would be used as moving logistics around. It would have been moving logistics all around the country. It would have been a great system for doing that. It would probably be mined regularly, so they not probably needed minesweepers on it, but it would have been being moved regularly around. There's a lot of rain coming down tonight. A lot, a lot of rain. The treaty powers will look and say you're lying, you say. Probably, it's only. Also, but I also know from reading a few snippets how Captain's industry influenced what system Webson came to production, who manufactured them. Sun ordered. But all others, including the Duke and the Austrian painter, asked. Japan, I don't know. Japan? 
Japan, it was a mixture of the two. If you said no, it, they, you could say no, but then the odds were you were going to get shot. So you had the option to say no, and then you had the option to be uh, killed. Take care, Dan. Sleep well. It's pouring a lot, and I don't have a rain jacket with me, so I'll probably stay out here at least until the rain finishes. Uh, let's see. So in the 19th century, the RM was spending a lot of money on cruisers to protect trade, but as the problem stuck into the 20th century, uh, the UK government wanted a cheaper option, aka the Battlecruiser. I don't think the Battlecruiser was cheaper. They were trying to get ahead of the curve. You didn't offend, nice 6831. It's more a case of there's not really many other options for them to go down. Politicians are always looking for options. Decline of British sea power by Desmond Weapon. New NKB 4472. What were they scared Vien would do in Korea? Well, they were scared MacArthur might use nuclear weapons. They were scared and Vien if he got out there. They're probably wondering what he might do. If I remember correctly, they're... North Korean border with China. Now, for those who aren't sure about it, there is a significant section of the North Korean Chinese border which does run along the Yao River. Uh, a Yalu River. And the point I'm about to make, and the point that I am just mentioning, is that certainly there is an option that under certain circumstances you could have got ships up there. And we are talking about Philip Vian, who was the guy who led his ships into fjords in Norway. Just putting that out there. It's definitely raining outside my brew shack. Heavily. Yeah, I'm sure this rain is staying. I think I do have somewhere out here a, um, a hammock. But I haven't yet put in the things which could allow me to stick it up anywhere. They'd have to go in there, from there to that wall. And have to be positioned high enough for me to be over the computer. So I wouldn't drop onto my screens. I think I've got the screwdriver and the components. I just haven't put them in. If I need to do that, I need to do that. But more importantly, I need to get on to... I need to talk about this one, next one. That's a shot. Vian, the naval equivalent of the Gloucester Brigadier, who, when asked how the Korean push was going, replied, it's a bit sticky. Yeah. It's something like that. Something like that. Alpha B228. I may be sorry, but seeing eccentric officers come from destroyers, submarines, and sometimes battleships. However, I don't recall many, if any, coming from the cruiser side of things. It's probably because the cruiser side of things, those officers tend to either come to the cruisers, or alternatively, and this is something which is worthwhile considering, cruisers have to spend their life doing things which are sensible. They have to be the sensible one at the event because they have to do diplomacy and deterrence and those sort of missions.
And most of the Nutty officers come from destroyers and submarines. <laughs> Max Ignorance, so how good is bribing the cousin, given all the questions asked? We're working on it. We're now, we're, we've accepted the concept that the bribe will work. We've not accepted yet the concept of how much the bribe will be. Dean Wong, is the Type 55 missile cruiser a large destroyer? I'd say it's cruiser, but many people keep telling me it's a large destroyer. So our next book, The Somerville Papers. Lots of people ask me, how do I know the stuff I do about Somerville? And these are the selections of the, from the private and official correspondence of Admiral of the Fleet, Sir James Somerville, put together by Michael Simpson. Now, this was put together for Rutledge. It's inordinately expensive, as a rule, but it's worthwhile having. It is worthwhile having. This is a note written on the 23rd to 28th of May, 1941. That Fred tells me that he wrote to the DP last week to say that a good many senior officers had passed through here and that all, without exception, had spoken very strongly about the way you had been treated and that if you were not to be given another appointment, you ought to be granted an inquiry and he felt DP should know what was being said about the matter. Now I think that was rather decent of Fred, as he's no particular friend of yours. As to my application to be restored to the active list... The Lord's TLs were loath to refuse my request, but regretted they must adhere to establish precedent. I suppose you must never admit you've made a mistake. Alan Hilgarth, who's just been uh, d d just been home, dined with me last night. He'd been at Checkers for the weekend. Asked Winston why a board of inquiry had been ordered on me, and all Winston said was, My boy, mistakes are made in war. You can take that answer either way. After dinner, I got a signal that Bismarck and Hipper were out, and by the time this reaches you, the drama in Denmark Strait will have been played out. My first flagship in these parts. I knew only too well the, so the, the soft spots, and you may remember discuss, uh, may remember discuss them with you. But if she and Pence of Wales engaged Bismarck together, then our luck must have been damnly out. Poor old Lancelot Holland. I was very fond of him. Alan Helgar, who had just been here, dined with me last night, and he, we had a long talk. He says that Force H, operating under their eyes month and after month, had, and apparently always doing what they set out to do, had impressed the Spaniards tremendously. Now the drama is developing. Our ship's closing in on Bismarck. Will they get her, or will she find some patch of fit weather? We are crashing along towards the party, but have a long way to go and can hardly expect to be party, be in the party unless she makes a dash for Brest or unless one of our, the battle cruisers comes out to try and make a diversion to help her. I wish they would so that we could go, have a go at them. My chief concern at the moment is to get a reasonable amount of sleep tonight so that to be ready for tomorrow may be, uh, bring. I don't want, to mu uh, too, want much sleep, as you know, but unless I get a bare minimum, I'm not at my best during the day. This is a very, very good book, and it's well worth getting if you are really interested in Admiral Somerville and his papers. Hi, Santa Canera.
Mm, I think in 1950, if it if anyone had the had a battle a battleship in the pole under Polish flag, it would be in the Free Polish. So if they'd still been around. So yeah. It's basically if they had ships in choice to do so, they might well have done something, but they weren't going to do something under the circumstances that they were in. So, Nero, I, what, what was that book? That was the papers, or the Somerville papers, produced by Rutledge. It's kind of like many other books I get in here. It's I, I, I get books of primary sources, and that's sometimes an advantage. For example, instead of... Uh, I now... I. There are papers which aren't in here, which I'd have to go to the archives for, but a goodly chunk of the papers are in here. So they're there, ready for me to use. Without me having to go to the archive which has all these papers in. Alistair Short, we were discussing the fact that British animals were broken before the war started, let alone by the end. But of course, losing one's friends affects one terribly throughout one's life. And as the animals started dropping the damage, it must have been it started causing to the other animals. It had issues. It had issues. As always... Ooh. Well, as they're flashing up um, that I should be inserting an ad, I'm going to insert my own version of ad. Thank you for all the people who've signed up to, well, sponsored by Jack Ray to be a member this evening. And thank you to everyone who's done super chats and those sort of things. It really does help. The life of a historian seems to be infinitely expensive. But fun, but infinitely expensive. And whilst I work hard, it is... How to put us incredibly useful when I have extra sources of funding for my research. Even though universities do not believe me sometimes in interviews that I have such sources of funding for my research. How else I'm funding it, I do not know. Par perhaps they think I'm a gigolo. Considering some of the adverts that get put in the chat sometimes by various bots, mm, there could be connections going on here, but that's not been my choice at the moment. Thank you, Jack Ray. It's, uh, it's, it's not been my style for current times. I have managed to avoid that yet. Mainly from the view of, if I did that, then there would be no one left for anyone else in the world. Because let's be honest. Sorry, I can only keep that kind of ego up for so long. Yeah. Right. Take care, John Sykes. We have more books, though, and I'm not going anywhere at the moment. Mm-hmm. Nah, I won't do the video about soft side interviews. And I've got more books to go through, so I'm going to get on with the books. I'm just doing that little advert because I every few minutes or so, I get this big blue flashing screen. You don't see this, but let's put it I have a studio screen on the corner of this, this screen here, right here. And it flashes blue in my face going, put in an advert from YouTube. But it's actually belting down with rain out there. So I'm not going in yet. And I've actually had a message from my family to say, don't come in because it's actually so much water's coming down. So I'm going to stay in here and read some books to you all. So it's probably going to be a bit longer. So you've been forcing... No, not yet. No. Let, let's put it this way. It's not fair on the rest of the male portion of humanity if I become a gigolo because they're just if I'm available so easily you know how are any of them going to get dates <laughs> so, I can't resist the wind up but I also can't hold it long enough to actually deliver the punchline I'm sorry I try my best oh I try my best <laughs> oh now we're getting on to Admirals by Andrew Lambert. So that's 0255. Better. Now, this is often considered one of the favourite books going. And it is a really, really good one. Um, it's 
cheap rates, Alice. Sure, seriously, I would never be that cheap. I'll have you know, I am eminent. In terms of my ability to find a decent restaurant. It's been something which has been commented on repeatedly in my life. Apparently I have the ability to find decent restaurants. Everyone else wanders into a place and goes, Are we sure? Da, 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 da. I'll look around and go, Meh, That's the one I'm going to. So. My favourite chapter in this book. At the moment. And I have about a dozen favourite chapters in here. Is probably this one. In early 1801, Prince, Prime Minister William Pitt resigned, and his successor, Henry Addington, persuaded St. Vincent to accept office as First Lord of the Admiralty. He faced an intermediate cri immediate crisis. The armed neutrality of the Balkan power, the Baltic powers, Russia, Prussia, Sweden, and Denmark, demanded that Britain abandon its rigorous inter inter interpretation of belligerent rights at sea with regard to neutral shippers, or else face war. When a dockyard workman used the occasion to go on strike, they found old Jarvie in no mood to be trifled with. He sacked every man who took a significant part in the strike. The rest went back to work, fitting out a Baltic fleet in time for the Battle of Copenhagen. Nelson's brilliant stroke crushed the armed neutrality and highlighted the yes of folly in the administration, in the, of the administra administration sending the feeble Sir Hyde Parker as his superior. When Nelson returned, St. Vincent immediately sent him to watch the threatened French invasion, more to calm the nerves of the frightened populace than because of any real threat. When peace negotiations with France opened in October 1801, the Earl prepared for a shattering assault on the administration of the Navy. The Peace of Amiens, signed in March 1802, allowed him to commence reforms that reflected his long harboured hatred of inefficiency, corruption, mismanagement and waste. Many realised that the peace was only a brief truce but between two exhausted combatants in a life and death struggle for survival. But such concerns did not trouble the Earl. In his anxiety to implement radical change, he is prepared to tear down the whole structure. His own experience of shoreside administration and management was limited, and he made no effort to consult those who were better placed. He visited the naval bases and was horrified. Chatham Dockyard appears a villa sink of, a viler sink of corruption than any imagination ever formed. Ports was bad enough, but this beggars all description. Instead of cooperating with the Navy Board, he treated the controller, a senior naval officer with extensive administration experience, with contempt, and viewed the board itself as a festering source of corruption. In part, the object was to reduce the Navy board to proper subordination, but it was also ideologically driven, monomania. Penetrating inquiries rooted out all manner of petty malfeasance, graft and folly, but St. Vincent's ultimate object, to prosecute the offenders and replace them with his nominees, was thwarted. This was fortunate, for St. Vincent had little understanding of the complex business and was too quick to impute dishonesty, while his lieutenants, the overzealous Trowbridge and the Captain John Markham, were attack dogs rather than advisers. Inevitably, the morale, naval, uh, morale of na the naval administration collapsed, while the much maligned timber suppliers and shipbuilders refused to, con uh, to contract. When the War of France resumed in 1803, St. Vincent's administration of the Navy was the principal complaint of the opposition and the government's main weakness. Little wonder the dockyards were short-handed, uh, short the timber piles reduced to matchsticks, the goodwill of contractors and workmen entirely, alike entirely drawn. By January 1804, even St. Vincent's own Admiralty Secretary had been driven to resign. In May 1804, the government was dissolved, but the Navy took a long time to recover from St. Vincent's ill-advised reforms. Fortunately, St. Vincent did far better as a strategist. When war resumed in 1803, he had selected Cornwallis for the Channel Fleet, Nelson for the Mediterranean, Lord Keith for the North Sea, placing the three best senior officers in situations that suited their talents. Cornwallis and Keith placed an impenetrable wooden wall between France and Britain, leaving Nelson free to act as the sharp sword of the state, ready to annihilate any French fleet to put to sea. Trafalgar was the combination of St. Vincent's strategy, as interpreted by Nelson and Cornwallis, men whose genius acted on a higher plane than his own. Although personally estranged from Nelson uh, since 1801, St. Vincent was stunned by his death. Despite the entreaties of the King and the returning Prime Minister, St. Vincent refused to resume the Channel Command unless Pitt apologised for criticising his administration. At a time of national emergency, this was mean-minded, partisan and pathetic. Only in 1806, when his Whig friends returned to office, did St. Vincent take to up command again, although once again his health failed and he stood down in March 1807. It was his last public office. In retirement, he occasionally spoke in the House of Lords, opposing the Copenhagen expedition of 1807 as dishonourable, applying old-fashioned notions of national integrity to a crisis that threatened the very survival of the British state. He remained a bitter partisan to the end and refusing to allow the honours and rewards of a distinguished old age to steal his venomous pen. 
In 1821, he was especially promoted. He was especially promoted to the rank of Admiral of the Fleet, attending King George IV at Greenwich in August the following year in a, in a unique in a unique ceremony. Yet such honours did not temper his hatred of the Navy Board. When the government reduced the dockyard labour force a month later, he wrote to a close friend. I agree with you in to toto as to the rapid ruin of the British Navy. Instead of discharging valuable and experienced men on of all dependent descriptions from the dockyards, the commissions and secretaries of all the boards ought to be reducing to the lowest number they ever stood at and the old system resorted to. One of the projectors of the present diabolical measures should be gibbeted opposite the Deptford Yard and the other opposite to Woolwich Yard on the Isle of said dogs. He died at home on the 13th of March, 1823. Admirals is a very good book. <sighs> Actually, I won't drink the milk. I'll save that for tomorrow. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Ooh, ooh. Ooh. Up. <laughs> well, Atkins, lol, I lost my tea. <laughs> you must be lousy at poker. Um, I will tell everyone I'm lousy at poker, Nook. But please. Um, I'd be happy for you to pay to find out. I am lousy. Doc, given uh, he had proven battle record in Model 1, if his battle brother had stayed officially single and not abdicated, do you think King George VI would have been an active RN officer in Model 2? Knowing King George VI, yes, he would have. And could well have been quite a senior officer for the RN. Um, he could have actually... The interesting thing is, it could have been him rather than Mountbatten in the far... in the sort of the Indian Ocean Middle East... Uh, far East Command. Which would have been an interesting one. Because he would have been good at that. Your songs. Speaking about books, my wife worked for a worked for a second hand store and filtered out a book by Contra Admiral Friedrich Lutzel. Oh, cool! Seeking on Simak, printed forty first uh, in March, 40, uh, printed in forty one. Fracture and all. Aside from or uh, from novice, worth it? Yes. Although I've only read tra sections of it translated. Night and Night Heron Productions. Details about Cold War sub-activities are few and far between, but you are, aware, are you aware of any books or resources from the RN and USN's efforts? Uh, British Naval Intelligence through the 20th century it has some very interesting points in it. That's all I will say. Um, efforts to track Soviet subs during that era in which they were starting Blue Water operations from the 1960s. There were lots of it. I'm curious if there are any accounts of RNUSN tracking golf hotels on November's when they were still to the bulk of new Soviet technology. There was a, a, a lot of work going on. There's a few interesting books out there. Jake Gimmoff, I watched the video there on YouTube comparing the beer cut to the Sea Fury, the upshot of which was basically no. The sea Fury was equal to and in some ways better and fought, and fought post-1945. They're both very good aircraft, but they're designed for different na for navies with a different philosophy of their fighters. Take care, Tanaferka. Yeah, nice. Have some nice sleep. Senior, what do you think would have happened if Prince Philip had become the first sea lord in, say, the Sundays, and only then his wife become queen? I think we'd have had a very good first sea lord. 
I think we'd have then had a very, very powerful ally at the head of the Navy, and the Prime Minister would have probably been very, very scared of... Let's put it this way. There are certain defence white papers which might not have get got happened if the... Because if Philip becomes first sea lord, and the Queen becomes the Queen, then there is a chance that... The in the seventies, there is also a chance that while well, he's been first sea lord, he becomes chief of the defense staff. Because how do you not promote him to chief of defense staff? Do you go well as your wife is the queen? I'm first sea lord. I am still on the official service list. Yes, I look after my wife, but I am still serving. It's it it becomes very difficult. Thank you, Melanie. I will have a look at that in a bit. Let's see. Ooh, it's this one. And it is 0306. Robert Rosa, I understand senior royals are expected to serve in the military. I would think there would be issues with commanders being able to run their commander uh, commands once the royal reaches a certain level of rank. Um, no, it's it's quite viable, and it's going to sound strange. You, the chain of command, the monarch is the commander in chief. So quite simple. You you draw your authority from the queen, as an officer. You hence you have a royal commission. And in the field, what matters not is your rank of nobility, but your rank of commission. This has always been the way, and this has been established. They might have power in terms of social power, but they don't have power in terms of command military power. And you give them orders. Very few... Uh, lots of us have found this out past. Now, this is Maritime Strategy and Naval in in Innovation. This is edited by Alessio Patalano and James A. Russell. Please know, he works at King's, and is a good friend, and is really, really smart. So, that's Alessio Patalano. And this book is edited by them, and it, let's put it this way, here are the author's list, and you can tell I'm annoyed by the fact that I wasn't asked to be involved in it, because I would like to be. Did I hear something buzzing around over my head, then? I think so. There, were, there is Underwriting Innovation by Hugh Strachan. How to Square the Circle by Michael Eckenhaus. Uh, Liberal Values and Imperial Evolution by Andrew Lambert. Technological Disruption and Strategic Innovation by Daniel Moran. Naval Intelligence and Innovation by Marcus Faulkner. Okay, that's like my old supervisor. Another from my colleagues from King's there. Uh, Neo Navalism and Naval Innovation in Russia, China, and the United States by Peter Domrinsky. Sustaining Naval Supremacy by Adam Grissom. The Strategy and Policy Nexus by Alessia Patlano. Bureaucracy, Innovation, and Management Time Strategy by James A. Russell. Innovation and Navy Time by James J. Wirtz. Human Capital and Future Naval Warfare by Peter Roberts. Innovating with U.S. Allies by Brooke Smith Windsor. New Technologies and Character uh, Character of the Future War at Sea by Milan Virgo. Naval Transformation in the Face of Legacies and Memories by Thomas Daniel y uh, Durrell Young. Winning the Peace by Ian Bowers. This is one of those books which has a great number of very good names in it. It is also pretty darn expensive. I have got enough iron brew to last till the rain stops. Skipping Africana, speaking of Cold War submarines, what do you think of Bruce Rule's argument that fresh air remained intact for about an hour before imploding and it was not a seawater pump failure? 
I would have to have done a lot more study on the wreck before I would be like to comment. There is a lot of different engineering data and a lot of different ideas about the fresher. The fact is, we have more questions than we have information, and that's the reality of it. And there's a lot of situations like that in history, that we have more questions about than we have information, because we don't have any of the details we need, really, from that. Come on, Cameron. I think it could be summed up by a comedy sketch on Channel 4 in the early 2000s where Philip leads the armed forces in a popular coup, a, a popular coup against Tony Blair. It, I, I don't think there's any scenario where Philip would leave a, lead a popular coup, a coup against any elected government. His wife wouldn't have allowed him to. She didn't like and doesn't like those sort of things. But it could be kind of interesting. Nighttime Productions, what's your opinion of Mount Badness First Sea Lord? You've heard my opinion of Chatfield as the First Sea Lord. Subtract some brains. So. If I read Andrew's Corbett chapter, then you're all going to just think I'm just advertising my old prof's book. Um, let's go to Marcus, because I like his books as well. You, I've recommended many times Marcus's um, atlases. His atlas of World War One and World War Two are really, really worth reading. The processing and analysis of ever-increasing quantities of gathered intelligence also requires continuous refinement and represents an area of considerable innovation too. While such intelligence inputs are the obvious areas to examine for the impact of innovation, there are more fundamental questions of its application and institutional importance. When did sufficient confidence develop for naval intelligence to be seen as an institutional force multiplier? Any discussion of intelligence also encounters the definitional issue of how it should be understood and what exactly the term encompasses. This is even more important when tracing the impact of intelligence over long periods of time or in differing organizational environments. This chapter employs the ideas of two leading figures in the study of intelligence. The first are those of Sherman Kent, who is often considered the doyen of modern intelligence analysis. Writing in the late 1940s, Kent outlined that intelligence was more than a, was more than a collection of material with a corresponding emphasis on secret sources. Its efficacy was as much independent on analysis and appropriate organizational structure to obtain it. Intelligence needs to be understood as a trinity comprised of a body of knowledge derived from all sources, the machinery task of obtaining and processing information, and the reflective component task, uh, task of its analysis. The second framework is that of Michael Herman, who has suggested more recently that these constituent components combine to form its own particular kind of state power, intelligence power. This twofold understanding of intelligence provides an ideal framework because in breaking down the evolution of naval intelligence in terms of organization, activity, and information, a concise overview becomes possible. Herman's more holistic approach in turn allows some conclusions to be drawn on the value of its intelligence within, Navy, within navies and whether it represents a key ingredient and thus innovation itself is in, is in the evolution of naval power. The boundaries of naval intelligence require clarification too, as much of the intelligence gathered for maritime purposes originates from outside of naval structures, Within, while much naval intelligence activity is also undertaken to, in support of land operations. A focus on intelligence departments within naval staff organizations is too narrow, as agencies and actors outside of navy or naval or the military establishments might also contribute. Here, differing national approaches are ever evident. In the United States, airborne maritime patrol and reconnaissance activity rested with the Navy, while in Britain, with the creation of the Royal Air Force in 1918, those, these passed into Air Force hands early on, yet still served naval intelligence purposes. In the agencies that emerged in the ever-expanding U.S. military intelligence program during the Cold War, responsibilities and capabilities of individual programs overlapped with different, into different domains. Naval intelligence needs to be understood as all activity and material pertinent to operating in and from the maritime domain. It's a very good book. It's an expensive book, but it's a very, very good book.
New York would be 4472. What would be so bad about Admiral Vian sending his ships up the Yalu? Mainly the fact that everyone would be expected to go out there and support him as he did it. And basically, the purpose would not be to defeat the Chinese or block them from coming down. It would be block their their their, their um, logistics from crossing the Yalu River. Martok would have probably liked King. Martok probably would have liked King, yes. Cables, gunboat diplomacy. Now, I keep being told there are going to be new versions of this published soon, which we can hope because it's a good book. It's a really good book. Like every time Naval Intelligence comes up, I keep thinking about Naval Attaches and their staff. Hmm. That's the correct thing to think about. Well, it's evening. Very late. Sorry, out for dinner. No worries. That's true. Yeah, how do you justify this? Unless it's Amethyst being, have been sunk. If you're talking about going up the Yellow River case of Vian, it would be quite sensible. It would be the case of, we are going up there to stop them getting supplies. We are doing the full limit of naval operations. Tian Wong. The trouble is, um, shelling might not stop till the warships, uh, till the supply line is re-established, but there might not be much alive doing the shelling uh, uh, in terms of the response of the naval, the ships, because the ships will be firing back. And let's put it this way, if he takes Vanguard or something up there as far as Vanguard can go. Remember, this is also the guy, uh, this is the guy who was flotilla commander of a force, which, whilst not with him, pre uh, not with him present actually, um, would take it ship, would take HMS Warspite in behind it at various points. Um, combined with air support and various other things from carriers, I would put their mission chance at about 50-50. Never rule out just how annoying British can be, the Brit st annoyingly stubborn the Royal Navy can be. Which was the section I was hoping to do? Chapter 3, The Altered Environment. Section 4, Conversely. By now, the prospects for gunboat diplomacy may seem gloomy. Technological progress is driving the strongest navies to a preoccupation with instant war that impairs their peacetime capacity while simultaneously offering victims new means of deterrence, defence and counter-attack. Warships are more vulnerable, less able to employ their visible presence as a sufficient menace, compelled to assemble at greater numbers and to undertake more extensive operations. Only definitive force, the rarest form, may be immune from this bias of change which is often, though less uniformly, reinforced by the effects of the political developments. These gave victims added incentives and facilities to acquire and use the weapons now available for their defence. They encourage resistance and, in some circumstances, retaliation, and permit a wider licence in violence to the victim than to the assailant. Above all, they hold out the hope of the assistance. Although new techniques, military and political alike, are also open to assailants, these are not always so uniformly available. The principal naval powers are often politically handicapped, 
while states with an international license for assault sometimes lack the warships to carry it out. So far, however, we have deliberately considered this problem from the standpoint of the victim. As a result, the political factors examined have elicited arguments not so much against the use of limited naval force as against the use of any force at all. It would be agreeable, but optimistic, to suppose that these arguments, or the more plausible, right, uh, plausible reasoning of writers of greater eminence, would prevail and the diplomacy would no longer be disfigured by a resort to arms. In 1969, another year of conflict in Nigeria, in Vietnam, in the Middle East, a year in which the British Army intervened in strength in Northern Ireland and Aya, staged the counter-mobilization, a year when peoples at very different faiths joined in the chorus, now thrive the armourers and honours fought, reign solely in the breast of every man, they sell the pasture now to buy the horse, following the mirror of all Christian kings. This is unfortunately an illusion requiring no refutation. The question is rather whether limited force is still possible, or whether we must resign ourselves to a choice between equal and opposite horrors of instant nuclear obliteration or indefinitely projected guerrilla struggle. This is not a question which can be argued here. Two comments will suffice to not, not to support, but to illustrate an optimism essential to the composition of their present work. First of all, the increasing caution of superpowers has confounded the Cassandras of the previous decades. The bombs have not gone off, and even the rattling of rockets in somewhat, uh, in, in, so, is somewhat on the decline. Secondly, the proliferation, and exe in, except in Vietnam, the achievements of guerrillas have fallen short of early expectations, whereas limited force, by land if not by sea, has recently had some notable results. Soviet intervention in Czechoslovakia has been much criticised, but the objective was attained and remark with remarkably few casualties. Perhaps the Russians were luckier than some of their critics, but perhaps there is also an inverse ratio between the speed with which inadequate forces are deployed and the degree of violence that entails. If we assume, therefore, that governments will continue to attempt the coercion of foreigners and that nuclear revolution will still reinforce the traditional aversions of r rational rulers from war, what expedients are available for this purpose? Economic measures may need not detain us. Sanctions against Italy, the Arab boycott of traffickers with Israel, the Berlin blockade, the Rhodesian fiasco are, are only a few of the instances that have rubbed home the lesson learnt by China of a century ago. When even the withholding of the indispensably laxative rhubarb was found inadequate to bring Britain constipated to her knees. There are too many alternative sources of supply, and there is too much rivalry among suppliers, a phenomenon which assisted by much assisted by bipolarity, to make this expedient effective in any but the most unusual circumstances. And then it invites and has sometimes received a forcible response. The economic weapon can be a useful supplement, it is not a substitute. Guerrillas and terrorists, though occasionally effective, even in territory of an alien victim, require especially favourable political conditions to achieve success. They also institute a weapon of considerable, constitute a weapon of considerable political danger, potential danger to the assailant himself. More governments than one have found these irregulars easier to recruit than to disband. In any case, the, um, their employment demands the sanctuary of a secure base, even a victim's territory or in a contiguous state. Not every government, however, enjoys the luxury of an adjacent frontier in guerrillas or, or an army, its own or a client's, to march across it. And although Guatemala in 1954, Hungary in 1956, and Czechoslovakia in 1968 are conspicuous exceptions, the movement of armies is hard to confine within the bounds of a limited force. This becomes even more difficult in the attempts is made to fly them into some more distant country. Unless airfields have been secured in advance by local sympathizers, this is a hazardous operation, and one which confronts the assailant with a choice between initial and perhaps needless violence and the risk of an embarrassing repulse. Parachutists are more easily dropped than withdrawn.
<clears throat> that sounds fun, Sam McDavid. Korea was not a good war for the Chinese. They they did achieve some great things in their first advance, but that was mostly through the application of humongous numbers. And the fact they were facing off against MacArthur, who was sometimes good, sometimes terrible, never in between. Nice ignorant. Whose bright idea was it to tan and rotor helicopters for ASW? Oh, so many people have claimed that one and then not claimed it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I knew that wasn't quite right. Basically, if you send Vanguard, you have to send her flag captain. Sorry, I'd forgotten this was in here. It's a note my dad wrote. Right on. So... War Memorandum Eastern, Chapter 2. Oh, hang on, I haven't put it in yet. Let me just do this. No, 2. Ooh, let's go for 28. Dean Wong, none of your takes on China I've heard so far hold any credibility. China in the 1950s was not the modern China. Please. <sighs> not everyone becomes great. Nice way, the Chinese army in the 1950s was bigger and more capable than it had ever been before. It was certainly far more capable than it had been. But in Korea, it comes sweeping in against forces which have logistically overextended themselves and have massively overreached themselves, overwhelms them, pushes them back, and does that very well. But in the scenario we're talking about, you have a sufficiently aggressive naval commander who, manage, who will mobilize significant forces to go and do operations which would be inherently aggressive and very, very powerful in nature. Mobilizing firepower and weapon systems, which are the very best of those available at the time. Yes, I do think China would resist. Do I think I think I said the option would be it would be fifty fifty which way it would go? Mm, that doesn't seem to me to be overestimating or underestimating Chinese capabilities. You're saying it's a hundred percent chance China wins. I'm saying it's fifty fifty. Because, again, if we look at the actual history in Korea, the antidote that was used to deal with the Chinese volume of fire, uh, Chinese volume of personnel was large application of artillery and high explosives. 
that was literally how they managed to stop them. Anyway. After all, speaking of Ian, why wasn't he given first sea lord? He wasn't that great at politics. He was good at commanding fleets, not great at politics. So, strategy may be divided into two parts, war strategy and preparation strategy. And of these two, preparation strategy is by far the more important. War strategy deals with the laying out of plans and of campaigns after war has begun, the handling of forces until they come into contact with the enemy. When tactics take those forces into in its charge, it deals with actual situations, arranges for their pro provisioning, fueling, and moving of actual forces, contests the field against an actual enemy, the size and power of which are fairly well known. Preparation strategy deals with the laying out of plans for the supp uh, suppositious uh, forces against suppositious enemies. War strategy is merely the child of the suppositious strategy. Strategy, the art of employing military power force to achieve the aims of national policy, must invariably be planned in peacetime to provide the framework for action in time of war and for the provision of the relevant armed forces. Development of the Royal Navy strategy for a war with Japan, War Memorandum Eastern, did just this, following the Admiralty to determine that their most likely enemy and the fleet that would be needed to defeat them in battle. This was the preparation strategy, and the Japanese were the suppositious enemies. Suppositious forces were, in this case, the ships that the Navy Admiralty wanted to enable them to carry out this strategy. Naval base of Singapore, and most importantly, logistical support for such an action. From 1919, the plans division of the Admiralty had routinely assessed the situation in the Western Pacific, producing war plans to counter a supposed Japanese threat, and attempted to anticipate... What could be done to ensure that the whole plan did not break down under the stress of the war? Numerical strength in the comparison with the Japanese was always assessed. Once battleship ratios had been settled by the Washington Treaty, a factor that actually worked in British strategy's favour. But at the same time, they were conscious that the size of the opposing fleets would not be the size of available ships in the opposing fleets, but the numbers that could be deployed and supported. The further away from home waters the British operated, the more pressing would be the need for refit and repair, hence the need for a major naval base in the region. As the Deputy Chief of Naval Staff, DCNS, in 1919, Captain Domville had pointed out to the possibility of war with Japan, the fact that any strategic consideration raised political questions about Japan's future as an ally, and that the naval planners needed to know what was going to happen in the Anglo-Japanese alliance. If it was allowed to lapse, the war became more of a probability, and strategic decisions had to be made in an imperial context to allow strategy to be developed uh, before a crisis arose. 1924, War Memorandum Eastern, which developed from the Plans Division's Variables Memoranda, embodied the Admiralty's own assessment of the risks in the Far East. From a naval perspective, the policy position necessary to counter this and the fleet needed to implement the plan. Indirectly, it had also be had a bearing on the tactics the battle fleet would employ, and there were several Far Eastern related assessments made from 1919. Captain Dewar, Director of Plans, pointed to the difficulties of waging a war with Japan in the region. The principal one being that the Japanese would have all the advantages of being unopposed until the arrival of the main fleet, estimated in 1919 to be as long as 90 days after the declaration of war. During which time, the protection of imperial trade by existing forces, principally the cruiser of the China Squadron and the Royal Australian Navy, would become paramount. BT as first sea lord made sure that the Admiralty's case was regularly aired, giving evidence to the Bona Law Inquiry in January 1921. Rear Admiral Osmond de Brock recognised the importance of holding both Singapore and Hong Kong, whilst Rear Admiral de Bartholomew believed a war against Japan would involve mainly to protecting British trade and cutting Japanese trade. To do this with a battle fleet would require a base from which ships could operate to contain the enemy fleet. 
In the 11th meeting, held in the February 1921, in considering the draft of the report, BT emphasised that all plans for war against Japan were naval, and that any war with Japan could not involve the invasion of Japan, only the cutting of its communications to the outside world. At an early stage, therefore, planning was, uh, was seen as an exclusively naval affair, not one involving either the Army or the Royal Air Force. They were just expected to provide the requisite forces the Admiralty planners required when and where they required them. One of the Navy's most more outspoken senior officers, Herbert Richmond, in the same session, expressed his belief that Japan, even by 1928, and even with its present construction programme, would not be able to mount an invasion against Australia, a common fear, whilst in an earlier session he had expressed a viewpoint that it would also be difficult to land troops on Singapore Island, as coast defence guns and aircraft would make the approach of transports impossible. Instead, Richmond believed that the Royal Navy had to concentrate on defending shipping in the Indian Ocean from raids by Japanese battlecruisers something that Richmond believed to be much more likely and much more dangerous. This is the fleet of 1920s thinking. And this is, of course, Royal Navy strategy in the Far East, 1919-1959. It's worth our reading. Um, I haven't seen... Um, Mark Harkness, I haven't seen his old naval's picture descriptions of a new US null rod. Could be kind of interesting to look at. Ooh, uh, Tian Wong, I'd be... Let's, let's see. Um, let's see. Casualties and losses on the UN side. 170,000 dead. 32,585 missing, 566,000 wounded. Uh, on the North Korean alliance of China and Russia side, 398,000 to 926,000 dead and 145,000 plus missing. Total wounded, 686,500. And those are the best estimates of casualties. Uh, there is also roughly between 2 to 3 million estimated civilian deaths, including nearly a million South Koreans and 1.5 and million North Koreans. I don't think anyone won that war when you're losing that many people. Mm -hmm. See, the primary argument I've had is that a twin rotor tilt rotor has more trouble hovering and causes more noise with the road wash. Sunder boys have good limited problems. I think they are still working on those sort of scenarios. I wouldn't be surprised if the next generation might include some tilt rotor aircraft. But there again, I'm also sure the next generation might involve Oh, the current book the book I was reading previously was Royal Navy Strategy in the Far East, nineteen nineteen to nineteen thirty nine by um Andrew Field. And I wouldn't be surprised if it depends on how things go. If you've got UAVs then starting to do the Sonar Boys, then you might be looking, what are you looking at tilt rotor as? as? It's, is it going to be more a command aircraft for UAVs? Is it going to be something which is going to be providing so, dropping, carrying more torpedoes, in which case it might be going back, reloading, coming back and dropping Sonar Boys and torpedoes, while the UAVs provide a persistent effort with the, deploy, uh, with the um, dipping sonar. It, there are lots of options out there for how the future of anti submarine warfare develops in terms of the aerial asset, so as we'll see. No, second, did Vickers try to sell an export nail rod to anyone other than Japan? I think Vickers tried to sell, uh, Vickers tried to sell everything to anyone. 
Yeah, there's a fair amount of rain coming down. How is it? Can you think of American or British officers who avoided promotion to flag rank or administration in order to stay in the field? In the Royal Navy, if you're going to get promoted to flag rank, they, it's very hard to avoid a promotion. It's very, very hard. You can say you don't want to, they'll make you a Commodore. And they'll promote you anyway. Um, you have to be quite careful about what ranks you get up to. If you can try and stay around the rank of Lieutenant Commander, Commander for as long as you want or can, but then you must remember you will get kicked out at a certain age. So, yeah. It's... Th there are... There are a few officers who do manage it, and a few NCOs who manage it, but they're rare. You might want to plan on sleeping in the brew shack. In which case, I will need to, I will need to at some point log off to start screwing up my, um... My, uh, hammock which is down there somewhere, he says, with more belief than knowledge. I think that's it, yeah. It's in my pile of junk in my corner. I've got a junk corner. Everything else is fairly well organised, but I have got one little junk corner which I'm sort of constantly looking at going, hmm, I need to do something about you. It's like, I've got a space in there which is actually originally designed to be where the tower would go in, in there underneath. But I decided the tower, the tower will go there on top of the fridge. Because also, the fridge was originally going to go in underneath here. But I decided the fridge would go there. Because I didn't want to keep turning around for the fridge and having to leech in underneath to get the stuff out. <sighs> right. So, I'm going to say, oof, well, yeah, as I said, uh, questions till the brew runs out, and then I'll call an evening. How confused with the fluffy research has been on? Dad's car is here, but he isn't. My car's not here at the moment. I haven't gotten the new car hasn't arrived yet. It'll be delivered, hopefully, this week. It's coming down from Luton. Which is fun. Yep. I've got a V40 coming. Last thing on, do you agree or disagree that the USA is declining quite power and why? Um, I don't agree the USA is a declining power, but I think that's because I think the US is a divided power. I don't think it's a declining power. I think the trouble is the USA is kind of like... Okay. Some... The USA has a lot of things going for it. They have... A lot of resources. They have their, a lot of their own resources. They have a lot of their own supplies. They have a lot of good people there. But they have to choose to engage with the outside world. And the trouble is sometimes they get distracted over what they should engage by. And I think there's also the problem that we all lulled ourselves into that full sense of security, end of history, unipolar world. Where the Americans were going to be the only power. And the Americans did such a good job of being the most powerful nation on Earth, uh, in terms of projecting that, that 
that all their allies didn't weren't stepping up and now America's overcommitted because it's having to fill all the gaps which it's allowed its allies to leave because they weren't needed because the Americans would do everything wouldn't they and now it's trying to rebuild that game you need it's it's going to sound strange when America when NATO was at its strongest yes America was more powerful but that was more powerful because its allies were also more powerful. It didn't need to be in as many places because its allies could look after themselves. And that's the thing. You can NATO used to have, well, let's be honest, three or four powers in it other than America who could look after themselves against most threats. They wouldn't stand up for long against maybe the, uh, the in total mouth of the, uh, of the Soviet Union if suddenly the world changed its geography and they got matched neighbour to neighbour with the Soviet Union. But they could, in their own roles, in their own positions, give a good account of themselves. But now, yeah, it's an issue. And they're having to deal with that. Hmm. Those are the G3 ones. Yeah. Yeah, this is the other G3 designed by um by Martin and Ami. Hang on. New York 472. Are you still interested in borrowing some books for me? Always. I'm now getting to the point where I'm organised enough I can do so. It's a Ned Hammock. It's not a something that's going to keep me tie a dry on the way in. Honestly, there is a point at which I just stick my fleece on and just go for it. The Volvo, Volvo had a lot of in, very interesting V40s. I like V40 estates. It'll be the second V40 estate I've had. In both Volvos I've had will have been V40 estates, and both Subarus I had were in Pretzels. So, yeah. Shang didn't have that many things going for him, Tian Wong. In fact, when you have your own head of intelligence is actually working for the other side, you're in trouble. Are the imprint books from your tonight on your Amazon affiliate store? Uh, they they can be. I have I don't I uh, honestly I get so little money from the Amazon affiliate store that I stopped bothering to update it that often. Um. Got to actually remember to add, uh, 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 put onto my store. Manage my storefront.
But yeah, they will all be there. Zonatou Mitchell, for some reason I struggle to imagine you turning up to University of Nebraska. No, uh, let's put it this way. I am the true naval historian. I am a true, how do I put this, academic. In that, yep, I turn up wearing uh, with these things. Quite happily, regularly. Yeah, you'll find the Somerville papers are on there. Well, pretty much all the books are actually on there from tonight. Sides Odyssey is. Let me see. Just check those out. One. Sides Odyssey. Add to my storm. Yep. Anuk, garbage bags make good improvised rain covering. Just don't have any of those in there. Uh, it suffered, yes. The Subaru has arguably a better AWD system, but uh, Volvos have way more boot stuff, please. I would agree with that. I would also agree that the the options to buy Volvos, there were far more Volvos available than there were Subarus. Nice signal. So the KGV would have been designed to last how long? Think of the KGVs as a replacement for the R-Class. The Lions are a replacement for the Queen Elizabeths. And you start to see, they start to make sense. It's a second class battleship. But they'd have been designed to replace a well. Trust me, if your head of intelligence works for anyone but you, you're in trouble. Yeah. <sighs> it's just not good. If your head of intelligence works for anyone but you, yeah, they're all that's on. I think the British way of war, I'm not sure. Let me just check. Add to list. Oh, I don't want it on my wish list. I want it added to a specific list. Yep. They're all on there. Um, the Calm Girls book. Is the Cam C set to Mushroom Farm Reloadable C? In Calm C, that is? <sighs> If you have a stabilized crane and you can get it in nice and neatly, probably. I wouldn't like to do it any other way. Cool. Lanark Highlands in his mini. That's going to be fun. Nice so how does war burn up an entire ship's fatigue life in five years? Because it burns it up to the point at which you need to do a major refit. And then you have to decide whether the cost of the major refit is worth it. And that's the thing. Is the cost of a major refit worth it? And also, how many refits, how many stuff was skipped to keep it going in wartime? How much damage did it take from the seas? How much damage did it take from firing its own guns? How much damage did it take from enemy action? And then you have a cost. This is how much it costs will cost to keep this going. Mm. The whole story of that period is not a good one. There are... I've read various books... No, not, not all of them. Are. I've read various books by authors from both sides of the line. And... 
because actually because of I was teaching something at some point and I was helping writing a core structure around it and so I needed to read it to understand it so I picked about mm, 30 books and read through them and the more I read it the more I would point out that China was in an absolutely terrible situation they had been at war with themselves for a long time with various groups competing for power using various cloaks to cover their competitions for power those could be ideological clo cloaks those could be nationalist cl uh, uh, racial cloaks those could be anything basically um, and outsiders also trying to carve them up and you have a situation which is frankly a nightmare to live in and has my eternal sort of sitting there going those poor people Alistair Shaw if aircraft if the aircraft carrier hadn't been ascendant the KGVs would have been refitted but there wasn't much point having them um yes and no it's one of those things if the if the Soviet Union had been seriously building another a battleship then I do not think the King George V would have gone as quickly as they did and definitely not Vanguard would have gone as quickly as it did but uh, if no one else is building battleships, you don't need to build your own. You can afford to focus on the aircraft carrier. But guy is interesting. Were there any World War II ships last as long as Belfast could have been turned into a museum when she was turned into a museum? Um, a couple, but not many. Oh, came close. Mostly cruisers. Cruisers lasted longer than most of anything else. So the KGVs were basically clapped out after four years for KGV. Duke York, three years for Anson and Howe. I mean, the World War I ships were already basically clapped out. You were needed to do a serious refit. A serious, serious refit. It would have been incredibly expensive and very difficult. I'm not saying they couldn't have done it, but I'm saying that they didn't see the need of it to do it without a significant necessity being brought about by opponent actions. Right then, if you haven't heard, the rain appears to have stopped. So I'm going to quickly head inside. 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. At least that's my plan. So I'm going to answer the last questions, and I'm going to say thank you very much for your help. Thank you very much for the super chats, the super thanks, all the other things you did. Thank you very much for those people who donate on PayPal, who are patrons, who subscribe to the channel. Thank you. You really do make a difference, and you really do make my life actually viable in terms of naval history research. Because, trust me, as much as I enjoy writing the books, 
The checks from do not pay the bill. Uh, do not pay enough. Um, I'm so sure Neros didn't take any damage from any action. I'm fairly sure Rodney would disagree with that after Bismarck. And they de certainly got hit by a few bombs and torpedoes and various other things during World War II. So they did take a lot of damage from the enemy action. They just kept shrugged it on and kept on working, but they still took damage. Nelson had to be sent back to be repaired. Um, Night Productions. On terrible situation China was going through, there was a great 1988 documentary series on China interviewing many of the great March veterans towards almost called the Great Iron Wall. Hmm. Cool. Well, two ships and museums just raised the SS Richard Montgomery and Turner in Museum. All oh, London will see her and more too. Yeah, thank you for that very fun one, Melanie. Um, Anthony Mitchell. In the modern Navy, there are prescriptive maintenance schedules. How severely do these schedules disintegrate during wartime? Is going into dock for months for deep maintenance tenable? It depends. You can schedule it, but then if another of your ships, which you are capable of equi you are equivalent to, gets damaged and they need X number of ships to cover a certain fleet position. Imagine what happens to your dock time. Thanks, Jack Ray. Thank you, Money640. Thank you, Alistair Shaw. Thank you, Stafford. Thank you, Alistair Sh Thank you, M30 Web Benvitz. Hello, Calm again. Thank you, Calm again. Thank you, 9631. Yeah, it's no surprise World War 1 battleships and battlecruisers that survived are scrapped or sunk as target of 1941. They've had it. Does that make sense? Yep. Jim, do Go before the rain comes back. I will do. Thank you, Ambazowski. Thank you, Mark Harkness. Thank you, Skippy Afrikanus. Thank you, Alistair Sh Melly CT40. And thank you, Dress Fongs. Thank you, everyone. Could Nelrod be refitted with 15 inch guns to simplify logistics? Probably. But would you want to? Again, this would depend. If you developed a new 15-inch gun if for the King George V instead of going with a 14-inch gun and you retrofitted it to all your 15-inch ships, you might well consider also for Nelrod, uh, Nelrod to put it onto them to standardize your logistics and everyone has 15-inch guns. That might be the way you go. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Anuk. Thank you, Rapid Razorback. Thank you, Night 6831. Skip it off Text was North Atlantic when Bismarck broke out. One on one, how long was she lasted? It depends. Um, let's put it this way. If Bismarck takes any damage at all, she's in trouble. So, ideally, she doesn't want to fight. She wants to keep away. But if she's somehow caught in a situation where she can't run away from Texas, then it's probably a matter of hours, but the damage which Bismarck takes is almost certainly going to finish her off, because she's never getting back across the Atlantic in the face of the Royal Navy with that much damage. Take care, Ron. Thank you for watching. Thank you, everyone. I know I normally go through and say thank you to everyone individually, but as mentioned earlier, rain and trying to run in in dry. So... Thank you very much, everyone. Take care, and hope you enjoyed it. Doodles.